this year. So. Going live. <sighs> We're live. This is the green room. If you're listening. <clears throat> green room. Green room. Okay. So you know how this goes, unnamed co-hosts. Well, oh, no, your name's in the title. See so yeah, ya, Alan. Right, everybody knows <laughs> what's okay. going on. I thought I'd keep it a secret. On. You just got to let me know when you're counting. That's all. Oh, no, we're doing live. Yeah, we're live. Oh, we're doing live, so we don't have to do that? Well, I turned it on already then. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what kind of monkey outfit is this, man? Come on. You'll have all your right. own, um, your own, uh, what a memento. <laughs> it's like okay. when you go to a concert and they hand you a little 45 single at the end. That'll be yours. Yeah, and you'll just hear yourself. I, you know, I, I don't like listening to myself that much. I gotta listen to myself all the time. I don't either. And I don't like hearing my own voice. Uh, speaking of hearing, moderator Kayla, can you hear me, Krista, and Alan? I always like to double check, even though it's been like forty something lives now or something along those lines. How did you get a moderator? You hit the big time. You just luck into it. Do the same thing for okay. twelve years, and eventually someone will be so brainwashed by it that they'll just jump in. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, not only do you do podcasts, you do mind control, too. I, I, I like this. Yeah, I mind like control, it. like uh, currency manipulation. I'm also a Freemason. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got my fingers in a lot of pies. She hears all of us. All right. Great. Yeah. Perfect. But yeah, I, it, if you ever want to come back on, we can just talk about conspiracy theories. I'd, I'd love to because oh, yeah. we oh, can talk you. about the flat earth for days. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Well, maybe not the flat Earth. I'm I'm more a fan of the hollow Earth theory than yeah. the flat Earth. Yeah, I, I'm more of, um, you know, we hear about vampires and zombies and mm. werewolves and things of that nature. Totally. They had to come from somewhere. Yeah, okay. it's the same. It's, uh, like every culture has dragons. Hmm? Uh huh. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But then then here's the thing. Once you start saying, well, all these cultures and blah 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 blah. Every time I hear that conversation started, it ramps up to full speed and then exits the freeway onto an ancient alien boulevard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, by the way, I'm recording this through Skype. Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's totally fine. Okay, so then I could run it on my uh, YouTube channel because I made announcements on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. Radical. Me too. Uh, and you can even have a say. copy of this after we're done. You, you've been promising me that you've been threatening me with the last one and I haven't gotten it yet. So. It didn't, you didn't get it yet? No, I didn't get it yet. No. You should have <laughs> set, 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 set a flaming arrow through my uh, castle window. But I'll, I'll, now that I know well, I that waiting, that is not the I case. I was waiting I for the coffee cup to get here first. So it got here finally. Thank God for that. And uh, I mail. got pictures of it. I was going to send it to you, but I think I might put it up on my Twitter page because it's nice. really a nice, it's a handsome looking cup. Right. It really is. I, I was uh, wildly impressed with everything that uh, from that company that I ordered all our merch from. Mm -hmm. Except for the one shirt that uh, the logo disappeared after the first wash. I was like, what? Yeah. That is, that a, is that a uh, drop ship type company? Uh, yeah. Or yeah. 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 Pay for it ahead of time? Okay. Yeah. Because I'd, I'd really like to do my T-shirts, but uh, I haven't been able to find a company that can do it better than I can because... Um, Here's a brief story. I don't know what time you want to go on, but a uh, brief story. Uh, my wife lived with a guy uh, that I knew in high school, and he and I became friends after they broke up and her and I got married. Mm. Bottle that one. Yeah. <laughs> and he was a screen printer for a living. That's what he did for a living. Now he prints stickers. And I printed my first shirt, and I brought it to him, and he says, okay, well, you got to do this, 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 and this, and this is how you cure it, this is how you dry it. And I, I do them by hand by myself. So, you know, I'm, I'm it for true crime. That's it. You know, I, don't have, I don't have help or a moderator like you do. So, well, and not, um, all, not all of us can be so gifted. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Or famous. Or famous, so, I guess. Well, how's the, how's, the, uh, how's the YouTube channel going? I mean, we're like, what, at 5% of your subscribers? Something like that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All it's right. gr it's well, growing though. I'm not I'm not worried about numbers because like, I I I, I, don't, know, I don't even know like the the uh, it, it all seems so bizarre and uh, and I don't want to be one of those guys who because I do want people to click the like button and subscribe and all other shit that everybody else does hit the bell but I don't want to be that dude who like 
because you know you you watch YouTube and you when you hear that or when you see that or when someone takes two minutes of the goddamn video to be like, hey, guess what? And your eyes roll so hard, I can feel my cornea is under tremendous <laughs> pressure. Yes. Uh huh. I I just say, hey, you know, if you like it, you'll do what you want. If you don't like it, then I don't have to worry about it. But I don't want to be that guy who's like, hey, man, make sure you subscribe. Whoa! And then like shoot a a neon basketball through a hoop and then like hit an yeah. air horn. Well, you know, I watch a lot of these uh, these creators uh, that have been on for a long time that have millions, hundreds of thousands and millions of uh, subscribers. Mm -hmm. This genre that I'm doing and the genre that you are doing uh, really can't follow those rules. Not because, really. Because, you know, they're doing, oh, how do you get a uh, thousand subscribers in a day? You know, uh, right. or uh, what are you doing that your channel's not growing? I don't do that stuff. I do you know, the documentaries, you do the interviews. Um, you know, my wife listened to the last interview. She said, man, that guy sounds like he's been in radio for a long time. I said, well, I think he, I believe he has. I believe he has. I guess but, technically. Um, well, my dad was a radio announcer for 32 years in New Orleans. So, uh, you know, I, I picked up a couple of, uh, uh, tricks from him. Um, my brother, um, before he passed away, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, was a baseball historian. Yeah, I remember and, watching the video with him. Yeah, and he uh, he wasn't very technically savvy, so we had to do like the interview over the phone, and I put <laughs> a picture up and did that, and, and kind of did some magic with uh, uh, audacity to make it sound like it was professional. Hmm, it worked. And uh, yeah, he was uh, uh, he, he was my one of my dearest friends. We. Um, we actually didn't become close till after my parents died about 21 years ago. Families are weird and, because, and you and I have both seen this, but you can see those families who are like, each one of the kids that pops is essentially a carbon copy of everybody else. And so they're melded together like JB Weld. Mm -hmm. Or each one that comes out is successively completely the opposite of the last one or in some other bizarre fashion. And it just blows itself apart. He, um, I, I know y'all, I don't know if y'all, believe in this kind of stuff but magic? um no not magic Dang. um i have a friend of mine who is a um she's an empath she's a medium i'll buy that the morning that my brother passed away she sent me a text message and she said i have a message for you and she told me what about you know he said uh you know he admired me he loved me he was um proud of me he loved my family uh, he was looking for a way out of the pain that uh, he was experiencing, and, and he was not happy in his marriage for the last five years, but he couldn't go anywhere. Hmm. And, um, you know, what really pissed me off was my brother died of a massive heart attack. On the death certificate, they put COVID-19. Uh, what the? <laughs> like, what? Well, whatever. I went, you know, I got to talk, because the doctor took his sweet time in signing the death certificate. So, but, you know, yeah, families are like that. He and I... We're not close uh, between, say, the ages of uh, 19 and about 32. And it's quite uh, a stretch. Yeah, he was um, he was all involved in his hobby, and I was into girls. <laughs> so, um, and I had college. I was trying to uh, finish college at the time. And um, he met this woman, and um, she was my brother was so appreciative that he finally met a female that would put up with him, <laughs> and he wound up marrying her. You know, and um, yeah, I get but that. She, she crushed his soul. Yeah. You know, but anyway, women, am I right, um, Krista? Yeah. Well, tell you what, wait, let's. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. Let's yeah. go ahead. Did and I uh, start a fight now? Nah, no. we'll just. That's, okay. <laughs> that's just funny. We'll just go ahead and get the show started. So uh, grab your seats, grab your drinks, because here we go. You're listening to FFOP Radio. Reach the <laughs> Welcome to the show. My name is Dave, and this is, of course, another episode of Everything Everywhere, right? Uh, you read the show title. You've been listening to us, Jabberjaw and such, but I still got to do an intro because that's what a professional does with his guests. So sit back and allow me to introduce you to my locum tenens co-host for this episode, the man who is possibly, no, the best Boris Karloff impression I've ever heard. Yes, of course. 
Uh, well, you know, you've, he's been on the show before. Uh, you know him. You love him. He's from uh, True Crime, Man's Dark Imagination. It is Mr. Alan Gotro. Uh, welcome, Alan. How are you doing? Thank you, David and Krista. I really appreciate it on this 9, actually 9.55 on this Friday night. Um, I'm having a great time. I always have a great time with you guys. I uh, hate to see it come to an end. Uh, well, good night. Every- no, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, good night. Every- <laughs> <laughs> That's our you? time. I don't see your see you on here. Uh, you won't see me on your thing. I can't swap or split my video to go to YouTube and to you. Oh, okay. So you're okay. gonna have to watch on YouTube if you want to see me and or yourself and or Krista, because there she is. I'm here. Okay. See, I'm pointing right. this way, but she's actually that way. Well, I'm gonna have to open mm. up a couple of windows here because. <laughs> I need to look at you. You look on your face. Hi. Stuff like that. Dee Dee's uh, here. Welcome, Dee Dee. Hello. Oh, I've got a uh, sound drop for every cool person who comes in. So here's one for Kayla. Oh, there you are. Uh, welcome, Dee Dee. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm. Well, you're wearing a green shirt with. You're wearing a green shirt with Dell on it. And huh? Chris is wearing a true crime. Because, see, Krista respects me. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's Flamingo Friday, so I had to wear flamingos under right. the green, and the Dell thing is an Easter egg for a friend. Krista is wearing her shirt. Mine, you cannot see. Oh, no, you can't totally see. It's literally draped over the next chair. It never leaves the studio. It's very true. Krista, right. hold it up so you can see my name on the back of it. I want everybody to see this. Alan made these himself, goddammit, and they need to be seen by people. Bam, there's my name. And there's the front. I miss you now. Hang on. Bingo. Because, uh... It was it was it was feeding back through my uh, oh. speaker, and I had to shut it down. Let's see. <laughs> I don't want to hold you up any more than I have to. <laughs> uh, well, while you're trying to get your technical end figured out, let me give everybody here a little preamble. So, as you can tell, we're going to be talking about true crime. We're doing German serial killers, uh, and don't do it yet, gentle viewer. But in the description of this video, once you are ready, uh, each serial killer we are talking about in order is linked in the description to uh, Alan's channel. So you can see there's one for Carl, there is one for Fritz, and there is one for Peter, because that's who we are talking about. Hey. Nice. So, bingo. And I cannot, so yeah, you're going to want to watch those videos because we're going to go and, you know, blow hard and pontificate and go over all this stuff. But if you want the, like, the real details and the historical documentary. We got Matt Willis in the hey, chat. Hey, Matt Willis. <laughs> welcome, Matt. Hi, Matt. Welcome, Matt. I got it. It's a joke. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little joke that shouldn't be out this late by itself, but okay. I got Basically. It. But you know what they call a man with no arms, no legs sitting on the front porch, right? Art. Matt. <laughs> oh, Matt. <laughs> That's what you call a guy with no arms and no legs hanging on the wall. Art. Yeah. Okay, so. If you throw him in the pool, he becomes Bob. Yes. Yes. Oh, my God. And Matt. This is just going to get worse as we go along, isn't it? Chris? Matt you, Willis, I hope Chloe's doing well. If you put him on the edge of the Grand Canyon, could he be called Cliff? Oh. The jury's out on that one. I can't. I need more uh, wine for this. Well, <laughs> she's drinking and I can't. That's fun. <laughs> I'll okay. drink for you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Cheers. So let's get right into it. So let me get uh, everything geared up here. So the first of our uh, contestants, if you want to call them that, the first of our uh, murderers. Now, this guy, we have the least amount of, like, hard evidence and or what do you want to call it? Okay, who are we talking about? Carl. Carl We're talking about Carl Denkin. Denka. Denka. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Carl, Carl Denka. Denka. Uh uh, yeah, Denko was, uh, he was known as the cannibal of Zimbiche, mm. and it was part of Silesia um, in uh, uh, upper uh, kingdom of Prussia. And he was born in uh, 19, 1860 in Munsterberg, Silesia, which later became um, Zimbiche, Poland. The weird thing about this case, though, David and Krista, is that his crimes had been forgotten for almost 80 years. Really? Until until a historian <laughs> actually found some stuff in a museum and um, brought it forth and that they have a little uh, area in the museum that he is uh, 
that they actually made for Carl Denka. Now, That's Carl crazy. Denka was, um, he was often referred to as, and we always hear serial killers like this, uh, quiet and soft-spoken. He was just a nice guy. Yeah, yeah, until they take out an axe and wipe out the whole family. Mm, right. And, and well, the, the funny thing, I think, that <clears throat> Carl Denka has above uh, maybe any other murder vintage or otherwise is like it it starts out almost like it, it reminds me sort of of Jeffrey Dahmer because Carl Denka, you know, got picked up because somebody mm. escaped and they basically arrested him on like, hey, you know, he made a thing, so we're going to bring you in and yada yada. But he was he was Papa Denka. Like he was. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, well, actually, you know, it's always the quiet ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the uh, if we go back a little bit and find out, you know, he was um, his father died when he was 25 and he left him a small amount of money and he bought a farm and he right. tried his hand at farming and that didn't work, mm -hmm. but he still owned the house on the land. And there was a small apartment back there. I think I sent you a picture of this, this apartment and a uh, dank, uh, just nasty, uh, right. you know, um, and, um, he, uh, was just very, I'd say it was a loner. Of course. Then again, you know, we see all kinds of, of uh, serial killers that are loners. Uh, yeah. This guy, this guy, you know, when we get to, I don't know if you, uh, if we talked about, there was another one that I did, a guy by the name of Carl Grossman. Mm -hmm. um, Carl Grossman. It was in this period. One of the things I wanted to set up is that in this period, we're looking at uh, between, say, 1895 and 1931. Mm -hmm. And there was a reason for this, uh, that these killers were, uh, I'm not going to say popular, but infamous. Right after World War One, Germany had fell into this decadence that uh, no one had ever seen before. Right. Uh, performing sex on the sidewalks in broad daylight. Uh, the police officers were kind of like, okay, what do we do now? They were fighting to find a form of government since Kaiser Wilhelm had abdicated in 1918 before the German surrender. So you've got people like... Uh, Thomas Schulman, Carl Denka, mm -hmm. Carl Grossman, Fritz Harmon, and I call this guy the granddaddy of sickos, uh, Peter Curtin. Right. Um, and uh, we'll get to him a little bit later. But um, Denka refused to move out of the house. And uh, he took up residence in a small apartment near the back, like I said. Mm -hmm. And uh, he ran a small shop, get this, yeah. where he sold meat. McDonald's. So yeah, uh, th this guy also reminds. So like, I I feel like we should. For for those uninitiated, here's a tapestry. Like I mentioned, Jeffrey Dahmer because we got this sort of escaping thing, but he does give off shades of also like Ed Gein, and eh, I'm on the fence about somebody else. But the fact that. Like he was selling the meat and also other suspicious items like shoelaces, leather suspenders, oh leather belts. Well, you know, the question I have to ask about this, and, and and when I read this and did the show on him, a lot of people had not heard of him. And he kept a, a, a record book mm -hmm. of everybody that he murdered. Right. And... They couldn't find a lot. There were a lot of these bones that uh, they found in his property uh, that, uh, you know, I had to make a list of them. Um, but um, he murdered vagrants and poor travelers. Mm. And uh, his first known victim was an Ina Lawner in uh, 1903. And in 1909, he killed a 25-year-old Emma Saunder. Uh, another man who worked in the slaughterhouse had been convicted of the murder but later he was released after they arrested Denka. And it was, it was a rather gruesome murder. Um, he was, um, he, he was kind of the Ed Gein himself. Now mm -hmm. Ed Gein, how many did he murder? Two? I think it was two people that yeah, he murdered. Yeah, I think officially. He was just a ghoul. He was just a ghoul. Yeah, he was well, a grave guy, robber and a weirdo. Oh yeah, well this guy, uh, Denka, my goodness, he could, uh, makes everybody look bad. Right. I mean, and, you know, but it seems like 
throughout history in the chronology, in, uh, chronology, each one tries to be as worse as the last one. I mean, and it's it's not intentional. It's just that's that's what they intend. Um, his last known victim was a guy named uh, Rokas Pollock, and that's where they caught him. Um, authorities later discovered that Denka kept a record book, like I said, right. of the people that he had. Now, on December 21st, 1924, there was a homeless guy by the name of Vincennes Oliver, or Olivier. Mm. Uh, I'm not really sure of the pronunciation in German. Um, but he escaped Denka after he attempted to kill him with a pickaxe. Right, a pickaxe oh of all gosh. things. Like, oh, man. I, the, the, the amount of times a pickaxe is used or potentially used as a murder weapon in vintage crime Oh yeah, rivals well, the well, axe. If you go to um, one of our favorite cases, which is probably going to remain unsolved, is the Hinter Kaifek murders in Germany. Mm -hmm. That took place in 22 now, so that's in that period that I spoke about. Um, they, this guy was brought to the police and then Denka was arrested. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then the police searched Denka's home. Right. And this is, oh good. So, okay. But um, before we get there, I want to, I want to sort yeah. of set up the dark humor of this because oh God. Like from, Only you. <laughs> from the start, right, we get to hear like, oh, you know, he was just a happy, like everybody loved him. He was Papa Denka. Like he sold, uh, you know, pickled meat to people. He sold goods, quote unquote, to people. And the fact that, you know, to the police are like, you know, we don't believe you, but we got to arrest you because the guy made a blah, blah, blah. And then imagine. OK, so here comes the spoiler. Imagine the surprise of the uh, the arresting officers to walk into his cell only to find his ass hung up by his own handkerchief, Deadsville. Oh, now you're giving it away. <laughs> uh, but thank you. Um, the, yeah, and, and I know that a lot of people are, you know, we hear a lot about uh, people being killed in prison. In fact, two of the people that we're going to talk about today, uh, tonight, uh, cheated the hangman. Um, and, uh, and one of them, people were just screaming for his... His 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 skull. I mean, it's screaming for his head. So, when we look at, um, you know, uh, why they do these things, if there's such an easy way out. See, I think what they ought to do is when they get somebody like this, you lash them down to the bed, so they can't do stuff like this. So they don't cheat the I, hangman. I semi agree with you, but the thing with like with Danka at least is like they did not suspect that it would be like I, th like you just arrest a kindly old man you know, on a trumped up charge or whatever you like you know doing lip service to the uh, idea of justice for this person who was essentially an attempted murder victim mm -hmm. like I, I totally get it. like let's say for instance Israel Keys I think he should have been locked up in like a Petruvian, Vitruvian man sort of situation so he couldn't have killed himself mm -hmm. but yeah. We knew what a type of a monster he was. Like, Carl was just, like, a nice old dude who everybody loved that was, like, whatever, whatever nice a pillar of that dude. community. Like, they were only what? doing it, they were only doing what they did because of, like, procedures, right, with him? Like, yeah. they didn't think he did it. Or... Yeah, no, they just, you know, put him in a cell by himself. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably took his shoelaces and his, and his belt, <laughs> which is what what we used to do when I worked in the prison mm -hmm. and um, they still managed to uh, bang their heads up against steel walls. Yeah. Um, they don't feel a lot of pain um, uh, when they uh, feel like they, they have done like, for instance, when I was, when I was working in the prison, there was a, a young man, he was uh, 16 years old and he wound up committing second degree murder against a Vietnamese store owner. Hmm. That was one, uh, one shot in the back of the head. Oh, and one Christmas, I'll never forget, it was my first Christmas there. It was uh, Christmas of 1983. And um, he was crying in his cell. Well, one of the guards brought him, one of the correctional officers brought him down to the watch commander's office. All right, Clifford, what's wrong? He said, I'm feeling bad, man. It's Christmas. I can't be with my family. You, the so, person you killed can't either. Right. That's exactly what the watch commander said. <sighs> and so he goes back to his cell. And there were steel walls in this cell. 
and proceeded to bang his head for 15 minutes mm. on this wall. And by the time we got to him, he had a fractured skull. He needed 75 stitches. Oh. They had to put in a steel um, uh, a plate, plate. Mm -hmm. in his head. Um, you know, uh, he was going to, if we hadn't have gotten to him, he would have gone all the way. All right. But uh, he wound up with a severe traumatic brain injury, of course, and um, some mental problems after that. Or well, who wouldn't if you bang your head up against yeah. a, a metal a steel wall for 15 minutes? Well, it, it's on one hand, you want to sit on the side of the audience that goes, how what? How what? The, you, how could you will yourself to do like brain damage, you know, willingly, willingly, like the, mm -hmm. the, the will to survive kicks in in all of us. But we, as the people looking from the outside in, also have never killed anybody. Right. So it's hard to Intentionally. say. Intentionally. 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 I'll say this, too. Um, maybe it's a controversial take, but let's say, because everybody knows the terms manslaughter, second degree, first degree. Mm -hmm. I think if you're shot in the back side of your body, first degree. Okay. If it's front, you can say second because, like, you didn't intend to kill them. Maybe they made a move at you and you go, pow. I, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Robbery gone wrong. If they are shot in the fucking back of the head, mm -hmm. back of the body. Oh, yeah. Right. What like, were they going to do to you? Yeah. You <laughs> at least had a plan in that moment to be like, yeah, pow. First, right? But that's yeah. just me. First, well, first degree murder, of course, carries with that the premeditation. And um, or if you are uh, if you kill somebody in the commission of another felony, mm -hmm. uh, I know in Louisiana, you can get the death penalty. Or if you kill a police officer, mm -hmm. you can get the death penalty. Mm -hmm. A lot of times down here, we've been getting um, a few years ago. There were a couple of police officers that were shot and killed and they got second degree murder. Uh, the person got second degree murder. If you get first degree murder, you're never getting out of prison. Right. Period. Second degree murder. You can get out of prison. We had. Uh, one of the cases that I, I, I uh, researched for uh, Dark Bayou, one of my books, had to do with, um, uh, we called it the baseball bat murders. Mm -hmm. It was uh, two guys that were fighting with baseball bats for over 10 hours, and they didn't see one of the guy's wives in the next room beaten to a bloody pulp. 10 hours? 10 hours. Were they, they on, like, PCP? Breaks. I don't know. They <laughs> take, take breaks? breaks. <laughs> yeah, they would take breaks and watch TV and stuff like that. <laughs> so what happens is, um, the, it took three grand juries to indict them. The husband got life in prison and the friend got manslaughter because they could not determine who swung the blow that actually killed her. Mm. Well, yeah. what ticked me off was two years ago, our illustrious progressive governor let one of them out of prison, the one that was serving a life term. <laughs> because they said he did his time. I said, if you people had seen the crime scene photos, you wouldn't be doing this. Mm. And uh, <sighs> a buddy of mine uh, is a professor of criminal justice. We went to one of his lectures. And I, you know, I lost control. I lost a little bit of control. And I, and I said, you know, normally I wouldn't do this. And he knew who I was because he read the book. Mm. Okay. Well, I think you're wrong. Well, I think you're a fucking convict that belongs in a cage. Well, and so right, you're an animal. I think what happens so. too, like especially now that we're covering like um, these vintage things, mm -hmm. the the more time you can put between you and whatever crime happened, I feel like that does a lot to people's minds to wash away a lot of the detail. It does, mm -hmm. it does. But then again, um, if you're in law enforcement or you're in forensics or you're in uh, work with the coroner's office, or you work with the prosecute, uh, the pro you know, the DA, mm -hmm. and you see the pictures of this crime scene. It's in color, okay? Used to be black and white. Now it's in color. The detail is right there. You can yeah. see what happens to these people mm -hmm. and what could possibly drive someone. Because let me tell you something. Carrie Myers, the guy, the, the husband, he wound up marrying less than a year later. He married another woman less than a year later. I feel like murderers can get married easier than just an average dude on Tinder. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. There's I like mean, a whole, I'm sure there's a whole like, like. If the Night Stalker or any of these other dudes can just be like, hey, you know what? Guess what? Prison's kind of rough. I wish I had a wife. And they can just, but yeah, fine. Write, write a yeah. letter. 
<laughs> we got yeah, uh, right, right a bunch of letters. Yeah, jail you know? bunnies or whatever they're called. Um, Probably. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if he gets the impulse to kill his wife, eh. what are they going to do? What are they going to do to him? You know, he's stuck in the same place. You know, over and over again. But uh, Carl Denka was, like I said, he was a unique. To me, he was a unique story because his his crimes had had been forgotten for 80 years until they they started doing some research on it. And actually, I I heard from somebody in Poland that actually uh, their English wasn't that good, but it's understandable, uh, was trying to tell me who this guy was. And you should do. uh, And and they got people um, on uh, that make comments uh, on my channel that say, when are you doing more German serial killers? Um, they got a whole bunch of them, David. They got a whole bunch oh, of totally. them. Oh, totally. Um, you know, from the 1920s all the way up to, to, to the 2000s. But what happened was, let me let me continue. Uh, when, when the police went to Denka's residence, uh, I believe there was a uh, some, uh, my grandfather would call it moot, in a pot that was boiling uh-huh. uh, that looked like uh, human skin. Um, they found 16 femurs. Oh, my God. Uh, of which one pair of remarkably strong ones, two pairs of very thin ones, and six pairs and two left femurs. Uh, 15 medium-sized pieces of long bones, four pairs of elbow bones, seven heads of radii, which is the elbow, nine lower parts of the radii, eight lower parts of the elbow, a pair of upper shin bones, Um Carl was also the guy who collected the teeth, right? Uh, Am I remembering that? I'm not sure. I'm I'm, not sure. If memory does serve me correctly, and this may be because I, whatever, there's so many murderers out there, but I feel like Carl had a jar full of 300 plus teeth. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now it comes. Yeah, it's coming back to me. Like a big jar of hard candy you'd see on your grandma's (laughs) parlor table. Yeah, but you gotta remember. A lot, okay, um, let's let's soldiers in Vietnam, um, American soldiers would particularly take the teeth of foreign soldiers and make necklaces out of them. Ears too, I hear. Yeah, doesn't mean that they're murderers. It means that they want trophies. So it kind of falls in that in that same line. Um, he, yeah, uh, they, for sure. You know, they also found a pair of upper arms and a pair of upper arm heads, a pair of collarbones, two shoulder blades, eight heels and ankle bones, uh. 100, 120 toes and phalanxes, 65 feet and metacarpal bones, and five first ribs and 150 pieces of ribs. I cannot imagine being the police officers that were like, well, we have to do it. It's procedure. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, and, and not only that, think yeah. about this, too, because there are... As with everything, there is a gradient when we come and talk about serial killers. And the type of killer that Carl was is like pretty close to the end of that spectrum because you have like the people who kill for no reason, the people who kill free because they're crazy. And Mm -hmm. then you go a step further and then you have the people who process the body Mm -hmm. to either turn it into products or to dispose of it. And that, I believe, would take... A little su- like a little extra mustard, right? Because if you're gonna kill someone and dump their body in a field, that's one thing. If you're gonna kill someone, butcher them, tan their skin, braid their hair into shoelaces, sell their meat, put their teeth in a nice big jar. Well, that's why ladies uh, back in the day poisoned people. They could just say, "Oh, he must have had a stomach problem," like Krista Lehmann from in Germany when she did. She killed the four people, at least three or four people. With mm-hmm. just insecticide and was just like, no, it was a stomach thing. Well, that's what they thought about Florence Maybrick, too. Yeah, it was. She had poisoned her husband. Mm-hmm. But I cannot you believe know, he, how easy it was to kill someone back in the day because there were so many. Uh, the state of medicine back then was not good. And so you'd be like, well, he must have died of apoplexy, which is. Uh, medical talk for, I don't know, fucking put him in the ground. <laughs> Something. I, I just out, you know? <laughs> Maybe he had syphilis? I don't know. Get him out of my yeah, office. Yeah, like, they don't... yeah my, my money's on syphilis. This could yeah, be contagious. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like he, like the amount of, like if you're into vintage true crime, the amount of times you'll hear the authorities label someone as dying from just a fit or <laughs> from just like, you know, Dyspepsia. they... 
Yeah, dyspepsia. dyspepsia. They swooned and suddenly were flying around with the angels, and they do do just close the book on that one. Like that, but that's it. We we <laughs> because it was so easy to kill the ones who stand out. Really have to stand out, like right. Carl here. Oh yeah. Uh, well, you know, I don't know if he did that just to stand out. Uh, well, no, I mean like I, in. I think in context of like, if you're going to look at vintage murderers, you go, well, there was poisoners and killers and they were dropping the bodies. Then you find the dudes who were processing carcasses like he, they worked at the Hormel Chili Factory, <laughs> like yeah. different ball game. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the thing about Carl Denka is, um, and this is going to sound really ridiculous, but I don't think he thought what he was doing was wrong. You're probably right. Uh, because he was keeping track. Mm hmm. Well, because they, they were livestock, essentially. Oh yeah, and he kept the bones. Why? Why would you keep the bones? I mean, weirdo. you know, yeah, it is weird. It's 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 screwed in the head, basically, so, is what it is. I, right? I had an idea earlier today too that I want to bring up to you because Carl Denka, like most serial killers, preyed upon the um, uh, the people who society had turned a blind eye to. Now, if you're into true crime, nine times out of ten. They go for prostitutes because mm -hmm. those people are seen as disposable by these sickos. Oh, but yeah. then I thought, oh, my God. What section of the population is ultimately vulnerable and has no leg to stand on legally? Immigrants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. let's say today, if someone were to go completely off their rocker insane and wanted to go start killing people here in Arizona specifically, it would be right. wildly easy to start knocking off undocumented workers like popcorn and you would be essentially in the clear because who's going to report them? They're not supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. And who even knows they are here and who can they contact? Right. Well, look at look at Juarez. Right. Uh, you know, it's right across the border, right across the border from, uh, what is it? Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, Somewhere in city. Texas, right? Yeah, uh, El Paso. Yeah. And um, for a long time, and even still, uh, there's nothing but gunfire. Uh, there are mass graves on the other side there in Juarez. Yeah. Uh, could they be, um, could they be, uh, you know, uh, MS-13, uh, could they be? Uh, but the thing is, if you wanted to hide a murder, that's where you'd do it. Yeah, it okay? like there are so many, um, so many recurring themes in true crime where, uh, by and large, you, if you're going to kill someone, you split into two camps. You're killing someone who you know personally and hate, or you're killing someone you don't know for the jollies or whatever your sick reason is. Mm -hmm. And like, what what can there be done? There will always be these uh, more vulnerable segments of the population. And like, let's, yeah, the let's, people that are coming across that are that are victims of the coyotes. Yeah, and let, you know, let's. They, they, so. Let's look at the facts of reality that there's nothing anyone can ever do about that. Like, as long as people want to live under the radar, when you're like the, the good thing, here's the thing, being on the grid or being off the grid. The one th good thing about being on the grid is if your blip disappears, someone's going to be like, hey, where'd that blip go? And then right. they'll turn your cell phone on. They'll find you some way. But if you're off the grid, let's say you're. At the most traceable, a prostitute. At the least traceable, an undocumented worker. Who and what and how, right? Mm -hmm. And oh, Carl yeah. probably figured that out. Because every well, his time... victims were, yeah, his victims were um, people who were poor. Uh, they were uh, uh, transients. Um, those are the type of people that are just make, uh, make for serial killers. Yeah. Um, you know, not like uh, if you look at, um, oh, what's his name? Kemp. Kemp or Ed Kemp. Uh -huh. Yeah, these, this, the, the people that he killed were not like that. The oh. people that he killed, you know, they were missed. Yeah, and, uh, or look at know, um, Ivan Milat. Like he would take backpackers yeah. 
And mm-hmm. and uh, again, like you wouldn't think of a backpacker as being someone vulnerable, but when you say, okay, you're in a different country, you don't know, you're lost, you're, lost, yeah. no you're rolling you around are? with everything you own in a backpack, mm-hmm. and if someone were to take that from you after they kill you, then what? Right. Mm-hmm. Eh. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, I did an episode on the lat, mm-hmm. and I took it down. Really? And yeah, oh, yeah, and the reason why I took it down is because I had a lot of Australians who, and Australians, uh, when they call you a name or they tell you something <laughs> wrong, it's polite. Okay? okay. And they kept telling them, you know, mate, you didn't do it right, you know, and all this. And I'm going, okay, well, what do you want me to do? You want me to take it down? Because I did all the research I was going to, it took me three weeks to do that, that research. And I thought I covered everything. Well, there's more to it than that, mate. You know, so I just said, but I'm what? just going to take it down. Like, yeah, there, I know. That's, there that's are so many, there are so many Ivan Milat videos out there. Like, mm-hmm. are they barking up everybody's snorkel? Like, number one, like, okay, so, like, I feel like maybe this is just my closed minded, idiotic attitude towards things. Why do you self degrade yourself like that? You're <laughs> because a very it's, intelligent man. No, because it's true. And here's why. Uh, it, it, everything in America seems to carry more weight. Like the movies we produce, the music we produce, our murderers, they just seem to be, and that's why people are unfamiliar here, at least with German serial killers, with Australian serial killers, with all of these things. And you'd think like, let's say, I don't know, personally, if I were from Australia, it'd be nice to feel like that blip on the map. Right. Like, oh. Yeah. Like everybody's <laughs> got serial killers. They're interesting. If you're into this, here's one for you. I, but you know, I we're spoiled for choice here, so I can't flip that coin to the other side and see what it would feel like if America were just left out of stuff and we didn't have that many serial killers. Well, the one thing is, is that you know, you're looking at you have anywhere from, and the, and the FBI said this, you have anywhere from say. 50 to 200 serial killers in the United States at one time. Right. Okay. Caught or um, not caught? Active. Oh. Active. Yeah. And if you look at near where I live, there's the I, uh, I-49 corridor, which is near uh, if you – where it's right next to, to uh, Texas. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's right, uh, you know, Beaumont and stuff. But it's on uh, – uh, on the on the uh, uh, Louisiana side, there's been over 150 murders there that have never been caught, uh, yeah. and it's the 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 uh, the signature was similar for all of these, and they never caught him. You know, now granted, he's not killing people every other day mm-hmm. or every month. You know, but it's it's uh, I think they they call it the murder corridor. There's, is what they call it. There's a highway in Canada with a very similar reputation. I think they call it the Highway of Tears. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yep. Same basic thing. What, whenever you get, because here's the thing, scumbags strike where there's nobody there to watch. So I'll bring up this dude, the Blackout Ripper. Like, oh, if, yeah, yeah, if yeah. you can imagine, like, if you're thinking, yeah, nothing gets worse than murdering. Taking someone's life is the worst. But then you can kick that shit up a notch and say, well, we've got a murderer running around the streets of London with a knife, just destroying women. And the reason he does it is because they have to turn out all their lights because of the German bombs. Mm-hmm. So you've got a despicable act now being perpetrated during a life-saving measure, and you've got fucking... It's cranked up to 11 because uh you know uh, it's it's one of these prime times to have murders if you think about uh i i did i think i did uh uh, an episode on the blackout yeah i did blackout Mm -hmm. ripper um he was uh sadistic totally um and you know the thing is is that what what kind of mind does that you know i mean it's it's just it's ridiculous i mean you know um when you got uh, a hobby okay uh for instance i don't i don't know what your hobbies are mine are um you know i read mm-hmm. okay i cannot wait until it's like silence 
<laughs> that I can write, I can read something because I can read something for very quickly right. and I can, un, I can, uh, absorb it. Say, well, it seems to me that this guy, uh, who was the blackout ripper is what they called him. And in fact, they, they, uh, they, they got, uh, one of the, the, the detectives got, uh, fingerprints yeah he got the fingerprints and, and 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 basically caught him but who does that oh i'm gonna go ahead and just strip some woman down and i'm gonna put my my knife and just run it down her body and open yeah. her up and you know and uh it it's it, it takes someone who is i think is is sick you know i, I mean i'm not I, I'm, I'm not someone who can uh, who is a professional with that? Um, you know, uh, people will go. Well, he may not be that sick. He may have be. You know, he can do. He can uh, <sighs> the. He can be uh, uh, sick, and then he can be uh, say that he's going to um, uh, uh, add this when he put him on to be on trial, and they say something like, uh, "Well, the legal definition." of sick he doesn't fit that yeah. one so they they kind of learn to i just think look guys you know he's he's so fucking lunatic they ought yeah. to just put him on you know shoot him i okay? don't yeah um, the what we consider like a get out of guilt or whatever free card is like so bizarre to me because like, let's say on the one hand, you've got the people who say, well, I was unaware of my actions and yada, yada, yada. And then you have the people who do like they knew they were planning, but then they pull that thing where they go, you know what? In prison, I found Jesus. So I'm good to go. Open those doors. Like <laughs> I I don't, I, I get why they do it. Right. Because manipulators got to manipulate. Mm -hmm. But what irks me is the people who go, you know what? I buy that story. And I go, how can you buy the story of a proven manipulator? Hmm. Am I too hard on things? Maybe. I don't think so. I, you know, the, the Russians have it, uh, very, very good. Um, when, uh, Oh, what, what was his name? Why am I running? How to, I'm, I'm having, a, I can't remember anything. Uh, the guy that, uh, he was he killed 52 kids in Russia. Oh, oh god. Um, I was trying to remember he he was uh he was uh it, it'll come to me. Uh Not he, chi no, well, Chikatilo he, was in um, Yeah, that's it. That's okay, it. yeah, Chikatilo. That's Chikatilo. Okay. Uh he uh pretended that he was nuts. Um they found him dead. I mean, not in dead, but they they found him uh guilty because the 15 people that he killed two two days after he was found guilty they brought him into a room that had a drain in it what and the guy told him don't turn around oh he yeah one 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 shot in the yeah. back of the head that was it Pop that in the back of the head. is justice but here's the thing. You got, okay, so like um, Chikatilo, his plan was like, I'll pretend to be crazy, and it did not work in Russia. Then no. you have the acid bath murderer, John Hay, who mm -hmm. literally, during his interrogation, is like, what are the odds of making it out of a mental institution, detective? <laughs> what? <laughs> mm. Like, an idiot learns the words habeas corpus, and he's like, yep, time to start murdering people and using acid. Pow, 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 pow. What? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and it takes so long for them to... But, but see, what they don't understand is a lot of these people, they may not be uh, have a college education. Uh, they may not seem like they are intelligent, intelligent, but they know what they're doing in order to get out of trouble. There's a species of cunning that can be used for good and for evil. And mm -hmm. if you are a charismatic person, so let, let's do that. Let's move on to our next person because I feel like he okay. had charisma in spades. So okay. 
Up next, we're going to be talking about Fritz Harmon, who, uh, like, dear God. <laughs> a lot, a lot about him. Um, he was, uh, he, he was known as the, uh, the butcher of Hanover. Mm -hmm. And, um, he was the sixth, he was born in 1879 and he was the sixth and youngest child born to Johanna nay Claudius and Ali Harmon. Mm -hmm. Um, excuse me. And, uh, reportedly Hartman's father married his mother when she was 41 years old and she's seven years older than him. And it was a reason for that money, money. Yeah. <laughs> um, largely due to a substantial dowry. Yeah. And, um, it would, it would bring it, bring him to him some money. Didn't help his kids any. No. Um, Harmon Sr. was known to be argumentative and short-tempered. Uh, through several affairs he conducted throughout his marriage, he contracted syphilis. Nice. Yeah. Who and, wasn't and back in those days, though, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and the thing was, you know, what happened was they came, they came up with this uh, this treatment for if you got syphilis. And what they used to do is they used to take mercury mercury and they would put it in um the penis okay and they used to say uh what was it one night with one night with minerva and the rest of your life with uh, mercury <laughs> i think it was um and um but uh, he had a little time for his children and he was a notorious womanizer yeah. and uh, uh hartman's Parents remained together until the mother's death in, uh, in April uh, 1901. When uh, Hartman got older, he grew into, he was very trim. And uh, upon leaving school, he briefly obtained employment as an apprentice locksmith. Ooh, that's mm. a good type of vocation if you're going to be a serial right. killer, right? I can't think of uh, a better one, aside from oh, butcher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. An axe um, maker. Axe maker. Okay. <laughs> We, we can keep going Wouldn't if you want to well, but, on that one. I just the thing about that. Harmon is though that like, despite him coming from the the broken home that every serial killer comes from, by and large, with very few exception, is that he was able to wrap all of that up into a charismatic package because th that's what gets you is if you like charisma when it's just displayed in front of you feels completely guileless because when you are with these people, their, their charisma is something that you don't realize is being used for evil because water, if you drink, it will help you. If you breathe, it will kill you. And there's a fine line <laughs> yeah. between those when we're talking about serial killers. Mm -hmm. If you look at, I'm probably going to get, I, I don't know if any, any one of your listeners are going to say this, but uh, hear this, but uh, Hartman was a predator. Totally. Okay? Um, and most homosexuals at the time were predators at that time. I, I keep telling people, prove me wrong. Okay. Cause you've got, uh, you've got Hartman and Hartman had his, uh, was it Hans Gans was his, uh, his boy toy. Yeah, if you see the pictures and, right here, we've got uh, the guy with the Hitler stash, which is always a great choice. That's that's Fritz Harbin. And then his lover is the, the little guy right here. Yeah, Hans Gans. And uh, Hans Gans basically uh, brought people to their death with uh, with um, Hartman. And But the one thing that was really weird about Hartman is he kind of went along with society because he became a soldier. Yeah. After a while. And then, um, he allegedly had epilepsy and, and they released him from, uh, being, being a soldier, which was again, I like to go back and touch upon like the quackery of medicine in that time period. Like mm -hmm. I, it feels like he was just, maybe he did like the army and according to some reports he did. And the, 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 um, well, he was a good soldier. Yeah. All, all reports were that, that he, he was very good at what he did. Um, but, um, you know, the thing is, is that you can, you can become very tired of that after a while, all the regimentation Yeah, and, and that's what happened with him. 
Uh, he and uh, he was known. Uh, he came out with. Uh, he was given a discharge, but he was given uh, a pension, and he was uh, what they call incurably deranged. Mm. All right. Well, number one, if you're incurably deranged, why is this man w- walking free? And also getting paid. And getting paid. And then he got a. And then they gave him a raise. Okay. Well, I so, so let me let me put this lens in front of the, the beam of light that we are showing here because it, it if you look at it now yeah, you will see a definite lineage of homosexual predatory serial killers. But I think that needs to be seen through the lens of like the time period because when you <clears throat> like cuz homosexuality was listed as a medical like, like a diagnosis of mental dysfunction right yes for yeah. so long yeah. and when you demonize something you vilify something you criminalize something that is essentially just something that exists inertly and innately in humans that of course that is going to drive some people to snap mm-hmm. like I, I well i think you know the thing was is that later on when we talk about hartman before he met hans gans he was a um, informant. Yeah. And when he was an informant, he would tell the police, okay, there's going to be a meeting of a bunch of homosexuals here. And then when they when they arrested all of them, they let him go. Yeah. Okay. And that's, you know, I mean, it, it allowed him to do things that um, they were enablers. They allowed him to do things. Well, and you know? also... I mean, the way you describe that now really brings home the point that uh, there's no like more poetic or uh, like the only way I can put this is that he was an Uncle Tom for who he was. Mm-hmm. Like the police are great at getting somebody to snitch on other people, especially if they are part of the crowd they are searching for. And if the thing they are searching for is something vilified by the public, then of course you're going to find uncle Tom's in every nook and cranny of society. Mm -hmm. And should we call them uncle Tom's or should we just call them, uh, informants? Um, you know, now uh, the reason why I say that is because uncle Tom's are more, uh, uh, of, of a racial type of thing rather than uh, sexual behavior. Well, I'm just saying like Uncle Tom in the fact that it's not necessarily race, but it is you are turning on a selection of society that you personally identify with. Like divorce okay. the race from it. If you are a blank and you are doing this of your own accord and or being forced to uh, villainize, vilify rather, and or you know, rat out the people who you are in the same community with. Mm-hmm. That is, I'm not going to say it's as bad as striking at night like the Night Ripper or being like Carl Denkin, being a nice, friendly grandpa, but there's definitely something. <sighs> I don't even know how to describe it. Like to turn what you are into something that you know, I don't even know how to describe it. Like, fu- well, I, I, let me, let me try. Let me try. Um, if it guarantees you a certain modicum of freedom, mm-hmm. then you can turn on anybody. Totally. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think happened was he became an informant and he saw he could get away with it. Um, you know, there's also, you know, he, he, he was able to um, actually gain access to younger victims as an informant. And the thing is, is that it's kind of like an undercover cop. Okay. There are certain things an undercover cop can do. Mm. He can't murder anybody. All right. They can do drugs while they're undercover and they can't be uh, held responsible for their actions. So, when he becomes, when Hartman becomes an informant, then he sees a certain modicum of freedom mm-hmm. because he can turn his own people in. Well, by his own people, I mean people that had the same sexual proclivities mm-hmm. that he had. And then he could go free. Maybe, maybe instead of an Uncle Tom, he's more of a Benedict Arnold. Okay. 
So okay. it's similar in tone, but the fact that because like let's if, if if you you know if you are a fan of criminal dramas and police procedurals as I am also, you'll know that all of their CIs, confidential informants, mm -hmm. like the dude on heroin snitches on heroin junkies. Like the you you don't uh, inform outside of the thing that you are in bed with. Right. Yeah. So it's it's like, and and, and Benedict Arnold is kind of an also shitty analogy too, because uh, there's well, it's not shitty. It just encompasses <laughs> more of, you know, if you look at it in a case by case basis, and he was an informant. He was doing what he had to do in order to survive. I'm not I'm not taking up for him. Right. But he did what he had to do in order to, um, you know, he didn't care who he who, who he let go. Uh, I mean, uh, or who he turned in. Mm. He really didn't. Nah. You know, um, uh, if we look at real hard at, at Hartman's case file, we'll see that he was a con man. In a, in a lot of things. I mean, he 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 did. Uh, he he tried to be um, later on. His he asked his father to help him have a, a, a business. The business went belly up. Um, you know he was also accused of um, uh, selling human flesh. Yeah. Okay? Uh, and he did what he had. He had this thing that he called the love bite. I'm sure you did uh, research on this. And he would uh, basically, when he brought somebody into his apartment, and I think we got some pictures of, of his apartment that I think I sent you today. Um, he would bite right at the Adam's apple. Was and that, I, in my memory, I thought that was curtain. Um, no, that was, that was, uh, that was, um, uh, that was Harmon. Okay. Harman cause had, had the bite. He had the love bite. He called it the love bite. And he would bite their Adam's apple. Yeah. Bite the Adam's apple. And basically, um, uh, break the oh. there's a bone there yeah um trying to think of uh, the name of the Your bone. hyoid bone maybe? hyoid bone yeah you break that hyoid bone it gives you access to the to the, the windpipe <sighs> okay but he didn't just bite and crush it he would tear at it out of the of the, of the throat yeah um so you know there's so many different easier ways to kill somebody <laughs> Um, you know, than just biting them on the on the on the Adam's apple, and crushing it. Uh, this this was something about. Uh, I mean, it just. And the thing is, he had to do what was called a blitz attack too. Mm. You know, unless somebody, if you look at him, and you look at pictures of Fritz Harmon, he was not an attractive man. Even if you're a homosexual, <laughs> he's not attractive. Okay, so he's just sort of a doughy. You know, middle of the road sort of dude. Yeah, and he, you know, when he decided that he wanted to start uh, murdering, it was very easy for him to do it. It was easy for him to to kill. Uh, you know, these little love bites that he was talking about, and, and when he finally gets arrested and he starts uh, uh, doing, um, uh, starts talking about the crimes that he had. When he got caught, he just confessed. Basically, okay, you got me, you got me. OK. And they found, uh, you know, um, I think there was some place where he was burning uh, body parts. They found that. And um, uh, he, he was for me to just say that he was a sick guy. Uh, how, how do you quantify a sick man when people later were more sick than he was? Well, you know? I think okay, I mean, so if you look at Ed Gein, just a second, if you look sure. at Ed Gein and Ed Gein was wearing women's skin. Yeah. Okay? I think that's a little bit more grotesque than what um, uh, Hartman had, had done. So, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Well, it, it, yeah, so I'll... I agree with you, So, and I'll call back to Carl for a sec, because, like, you know, we don't really have a breakdown of what Carl did to process his victims for whatever he did them mm -hmm. for. With with um, with Fritz here, we have that. Like he gave us the account of like drinking the coffee, what he did with the organs, how he would cut the bodies, what he would put in the toilet, what he would put in the river. 
And it when, when laid out baldly like that, there's something more horrifying about like those horrifying details given to you matter of factly than having to piece them together after the fact, like with Carl, if you say, Oh my God, just imagine the butchering that's going on. Your mind can fill in the blanks, but it will be gracious enough to you to leave a lot of the details that could have happened out with Fritz. He's like, Hey, check it out. I would put the intestines, the liver, the lungs, I would chop them all up and put them in the toilet. And if it were just like, yeah, I would chop them up and I would get rid of them in various places, you'd be like, oh, God, the horror. But then the flippant nature of being like, yeah, you know, put on a pot of Folgers, sit down with a nice paper as the body rapidly cooled on the floor. I would build up my courage and these horrible things would happen. Well, one of the one of the people that you, you can draw a correlation between Fritz Harmon is another guy by the name of Joachim Kroll. Mm -hmm. uh, Joachim Kroll was in the uh, 50s, uh, actually 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, this guy was not, uh, you know, uh, an attractive man, period. He wasn't a homosexual killer. He, uh, but he was, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to murder my, uh, the people. Um, I'm going to take their flesh i'm going to eat their flesh and what what's left i'm going to th throw it in the toilet now yeah. it ain't going to stay in the toilet all right <laughs> it's going to eventually pop up and people are going to find out what happened okay um and, but if you look at uh carl denka and you look at um hartman as compared to Joachim Kroll, their methods of eliminating victims was a little bit more efficient than Joachim Kroll. Um, yeah. If if, uh, uh, Hart, uh, if um, Denka's last victim had not escaped, he could have gone on for years. Yeah, uh, he would have okay. taken that to his grave, and people would have, after, like, they would have been like crying in the streets of his small town as they lowered that asshole into the ground, not knowing that potentially the whole town had eaten pickled human. Oh yeah. Could you imagine oh, yeah. being a person that went to his place and gotten food and been like, Oh my God, did I eat like my neighbor or like, or so-and-so or I yeah, don't you're like eating, people, eating but like, a, uh, tra a drifter essentially. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we, you know, I, I, I keep hearing that McDonald's serves flesh, okay? um, you know, and I have I have stopped eating uh, hamburgers for McDonald's. I usually eat the the uh, just the, on the, the off nuggets. chance. Yeah, just off on the off chance. You know, I don't know what the hell's going on lately, but uh, you know, we have a. I'm, I'm sure you guys have a White Castle. No, uh, sadly, it never one. made it across the Mississippi. Okay, well, we have them. They sell them uh, at a Tasty Donuts. They have uh, castle burgers. Oh. oh my God, those things are freaking delicious. Totally. Okay. <laughs> well, they don't get them from McDonald's, so those are the only hamburgers I eat. I try not to eat a lot of beef, but again, if you get back to uh, Denka and you get back to uh, Hartman, uh, their disposal was a lot cleaner than later serial killers. Mm -hmm. Okay. That I don't. You know, Denka didn't want to get caught. I mean, no, uh, you know, none of them want to get caught. But, you know, uh, and as we'll see later on with Curtin, well, actually, um, Hartman actually confessed after he was arrested. Um, a lot of uh, so did Curtin, Peter Curtin. You know, he tried to stay under the radar for a long time. Uh, but, you know, uh, the thing another thing that taught that, that lesson that I learned from this is that you can't have an accomplice if no. you're a serial killer. Like, it's okay. rule number one. If you're going mm -hmm. to do something illegal, do it by yourself. Oh, yeah. Two people, gonna, can, <laughs> two people can gonna, keep a secret if one of them is dead. Exactly. <laughs> well, actually, three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. There you go. Uh, <laughs> that was Benjamin Franklin said that. Um, but I think... The reason why a lot of people are, 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 are interested in Hartman um, uh, is because uh, his his not only is his murders uh, were so, for lack of a better term, decadent, but 
his lifestyle was more decadent. All right. And it, I think that's why a lot of people are interested in that. Um, there was a guy in, um, in in Belgium. His name was Marc Dutro. I did a, I did an episode on him. He was a, a human trafficker mm -hmm. and um, he had uh, young kids and um, he uh, killed them. OK. And they only got him for two murders. Mm -hmm. But the rumors were that he committed over 100 of them. That's always well, where does the that way. information come from? Where does that information come from that he killed over 100 people? OK, it's not because but it's really weird, though, David and Krista, if you look at a serial killer, the worst serial killers always get the most airtime. Yeah, well, because like that's it, it, it's a reverse correlative, right? Because the better someone is at serial killing or whatever crime they decide to do, they'll leave less evidence and therefore there will be less for us to talk about. We. Uh, we only get the idiots who get caught and then we back engineer them as these like geniuses and or charismatic figures and or competent people who just slipped up a little here or there. But if you think about it, oftentimes the serial killers we have just left mistake after mistake after mistake. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like, th like to, to go back to the FBI stat from before where you have up to 200 active serial killers they must be doing something right. And the reason why we don't know what they're doing is because they're going and not getting caught. Yeah, they're right. not getting, that's true. They're not getting caught, but somebody knows who they are. Oh, totally. Uh, somebody always knows who they are. Um, there's one uh, serial killer up in uh, New York, uh, the Long Island Strangler. They still haven't found out who that is. There's, they still haven't found out who that is. <laughs> if we look at Hartman, if we just look at his case, OK. The degradation that he used, mm -hmm. um, he was, again, going after people that were uh, the ones that would he thought would not be missed. Yeah. The marginalized part of yeah, society. The marginalized. OK. Um, but somebody out there cares and somebody out there knows. And if you look at um, how he was caught. Excuse me. He could he couldn't have lived. He, he couldn't have gotten away with it for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, serial killers stop killing for one reason or another. Either they get arrested or they're dead. Yeah. All right. But he would have gone through. And again, he was a serial killer of his time. Uh, him along with, uh, you know, uh, Denka and um, and uh, and Peter Curtin. Mm -hmm. They were products of their time. There were, because if you look at their lives, well, Peter Curtin, I mean, Peter Curtin, his father, when we get to that, mm -hmm. his father used to have sex with his mother right. in the same room that the kids were sleeping. Boy, okay. like, God yeah, damn, talking. like, I cannot, like, mm -hmm. there, there are plenty of ways you can say, oh, well, this is detrimental to a, another living being, whether it be abuse mentally or physically. Mm -hmm. I... If if there's one person on earth who will say, I don't think that's abuse, I would be flabbergasted. But if you actively make your small children sit and be a captive audience as you sexually assault your uncomfortable at best and miserable at worst wife, mm -hmm. what what do you what could what could you expect of that person? What could you expect as to as to what uh, influence it would have on your children. You yeah, know, like it's, it's that, that's just serial killers waiting to happen, you know, but he was the only one in that brood that actually grew up to be what I would call a sexual sadist. All the other children, according to what, what I've read grew up normal. Well, I'm <laughs> relatively probably well, yeah, yeah, relatively normal, with, with, yeah. with, with humans. It is almost like rolling a million sided die, right? Because okay. you've got like the kids who grew up with a silver spoon in their mouth who just one day decide, you know what? Killing people seems like a laugh. And they do that. And you go, well, what happened? You had all the money, you had all the opportunity. And then you go, whoa. 
And then you've got the other side of that coin where someone is just treated like, you know, a, a subspecies of human. And on one hand, they can, as soon as they break out, there's some sort of savant on the piano or whatever, or the die rolls and they're a murderer. But the, you right. can't, you you like, it's kind of like Jack the Ripper. We'll never know who Jack the Ripper is, and we'll never be able to point to one, two, three, or even ten things in a person's life where you can be like, oh, pff, bam, that's going to make him a serial killer. We've got the symptoms after the fact. Love of fire, hurting small animals, wetting the bed. But by then it's too late, right? Right, when you find yeah, out about all that. Yeah. It is. Um, why don't we do this? Because everything you're saying... Uh, would refer to Peter Curtin. All right, let's so move let, to Curtin. Let's, yeah, let's fin well, let's finish with Hartman. Well, yeah, because uh, all we got was oh yeah. So what did he, so he killed the were they? <sighs> he killed all these people. Did all that stuff with the. I think flesh and the crap. wildest part about this case is the trial. Well, how did he get caught? Did we talk about how he got caught, or did I did I completely miss it? How did he get caught? Uh, I, I think you missed it. So we're gonna we're just gonna breeze past it. But anyway, no, <laughs> um, he um, they they uh, a lot of people in his building knew that there were people going in and very few people coming out. Oh. Yeah, They're and always so, nosy neighbors. Uh, he thought he was gonna get away with being an informant again, and a lot of people, uh, you know. And then I think what happened was Hans Gans was the one that turned on him. Mm. And um, there was a um, – they went to trial. They arrested him, and then he, he admitted it. Yeah, so I killed these people, okay? I've always wondered why it is that if somebody confesses to a crime, they still put them on trial anyway. Well, because the, the amount of false confessions we've gotten over the years. Well, yeah, but if you, can, if you can give them some sort of, some sort of collateral type of – yeah, uh, that evidence that they committed the crime. And but, you know, there was clothes of the victim. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of bones of the victim. Um, there was an, a picture that I think there was uh, one of the I think it was in Peter. Cur that was Peter Curtin. We'll get to him a little bit later. But uh, the police knew it was him. They knew it was him. They knew he had done something. And then when he confessed, OK, you got me. And then Gans, uh he was the one that provided the eyewitness account mm. that actually convicted Hartman. Which, right? so yeah, and then that sort of rolls into the drama of the case because, you know, Fritz is vindictive, wants to take down Hans. And then, mm -hmm. unbelievably, like in the 11th hour, in a clutch, uh, Fritz is like, oh, you know what? I feel kind of bad about framing, quote unquote, Hans, who was definitely complicit in all that shit. Mm -hmm. But th mm -hmm. that 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 uh, that Hail Mary at the end where he writes that letter right before he's let out to the guillotine or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you know what? Just kidding. He's a totally cool dude. Smell you later. And then boop off with his head. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the one thing that happened, you know, this trial that took place was two weeks and 190 witnesses, yeah. uh, which is a lot, okay? I mean, there was no denying that, that, that Hartman did it. Uh, he was judged sane at his trial, and um, he was found guilty of 24 of the 27 murders and sentenced to death by beheading. And that letter that you talked about, uh, he, he, one of the statements that he had in the letter, he said, he quote, I quote, I shall go to the decapitating block joyfully and happily. End quote. Yeah. And on the 15th of April, 1925, uh, he is beheaded by guillotine in the grounds of Hanover prison. And his last words were, uh, I repent, but I do not fear death. His head was uh, taken from the body and it was put in formaldehyde and used at the University of Mannheim. Yeah. And they, and they didn't get rid of the head until 2014. It, oh my God. The, they burned it. Yeah. Uh, and Gans, <laughs> I think Gans got out of prison in the late 60s, early 70s. Mm. You know, and, and think about this. Gans was in prison from 
1931, 32 until through World War Two. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, this guy. But, you know, if you look at at, at what. This um, why would they keep his head? Why well, would they keep his head? It's so, kind of like there's OK, you, there is a. God damn it. I'm now I can't remember who it is, but there's a famous museum that has a big box with a murderer in it and his preserved body is in there decapitated and all. Okay, is it decapitated or is his or is it his skeleton because that's William Hare? Maybe Okay, no, it's not it, it's not hair, but yeah, hair okay. they did keep for a long ass time too. I'm yeah. bad with names. But yeah, the amount of like Serial killer heads that end up in collections, whether medical, scientific, or just as a gaff, is bonkers. Yeah, that, well, they, you know, study the brain. You yeah. know, that's uh, basically if you look at the Leopold Loeb case. All right, these these kid, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a pair of eyeglasses that got him in trouble. That they, you know, killed this kid Bob, uh, Bobby Franks, and then they confessed. And yeah. then what happened was so much get, for the perfect uh, murder. Yeah, and they get uh, 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 Clarence Darrow says, we can't kill these guys. We have to study them. <laughs> well, that doesn't work. No. It doesn't work. You know? Um, so why would you keep the head? I think it's it's very morbid. I think it's very morbid this, that they kept his head. I think okay? this calls back to why. our medical quackery because mm -hmm. for some reason— in like the around that time, the turn of the century from like 18 whatever to 19 whatever early, mm -hmm. for some reason, scientists and medical professionals thought that when they cracked open the head of someone aberrant, like a serial killer or whatever, that they would see like maybe some gears or a mouse or a bunch of bats would fly out. But 10 times out of 10, it is just a brain structured visually, just like everybody else's, because what's happening is microscopic it's chemical it's electrical so they cut open their heads and they go yep pff, looks like a brain to me i don't know put it back on the shelf well yeah they didn't yeah. have what they what we have now so they yeah. can't see it through it through their eyes but they MRI. kept doing it for so long like i don't know who was the diehard fan of keeping heads so he could look at brains to see if he could figure something out just with a visual inspection Kayla says, you know you want your own serial killer head for your studio's collection. <laughs> we'll get to it, Kayla, yeah. because there <laughs> is a... We'll talk about Peter Curtin in a second. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, th so the fact that um, they took his head, and it it's so wild to me. They'll do death masks and take heads and all this other stuff, whereas, like, it just feels like we... Even even the human beings involved in law enforcement were just stuck on, like, the Barnum and Bailey freak show aspect of it. There, there was a movie a long time ago. Can, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. There was a movie a long time ago, and I loved this movie. When I was a kid, uh, we used to—they had drive-ins. I don't know if they had drive-ins when, totally. when you guys were younger. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> It's a movie called Chamber of Horrors. And <clears throat> Patrick Is that with Vincent Price? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Patrick O'Neill, uh, Cesare Deneva, and believe it or not, Wayne Rogers. This is before Wayne Rogers became uh, a big superstar. And what it, uh, Patrick O'Neill was um, a murderer. And what he did was um, he would uh, kill women and then marry them. <laughs> by uh, by uh, use use a, 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 a gun a firearm to get a uh, justice of a peace to marry him. Well, what happens is the police find him, and they in order to keep him where he was on on a train to get to uh, to jail, they put uh, handcuffs on one of these wheels on a caboose of a train, and when the cops weren't looking, Patrick O'Neill took off his hand so that he could become uh, free. Wow. Well, what he did was, later on, he found a mechanism that would 
clamp on to his stump, for lack of a better word. Right. That was either a an axe or a, a, a stiletto or something like that. And he was going after people that caught him. And he was um, basically taking, like the judge, he took the judge, he took uh, he took uh, somebody that was the 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 um, the uh, the one that uh, takes uh, what what he said. What is that transcriber? The, the stenographer. Uh, yeah. yeah, stenographer. And he was he was he was assembling a body based upon all these people that became his nemesis. Mm. And the thing was is that people believed that he died after he cut off his arm, but he didn't. He actually was fighting against the, um, the, the, the policeman who was Wayne Rogers actually, uh, was, was one of them. And it would be like the, uh, he took the, the head off and that would be the, the, the head of justice and <laughs> the arms and stuff like that. So, um, where was I going with this? I have no idea. It was just a great, great, great movie. Well, you know, uh, but, it, it reminds me, like, with the interchangeable hand uh, accoutrement, it reminds me of Ash from Army of Darkness with his chainsaw arm and or, god dang it, who is that? Okay, the the uh, the uh, the officer in Young Frankenstein with the, the wooden hand, he's got to move all over the place. Kind of puts me in the mind Mars, of that shit, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I knew you would pick a com- comedic type, of thing <laughs> that, but, um, um, but you know, to, to, for someone to say, you know, I repent, but I do not fear death. Um, Hartman would have taken so many people with him, and it's 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 just it's ridiculous that um, you know these people don't understand. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's no recidivism for a a, a, a stone cold killer. No. Right. Okay. So, um, all right. You want to go? You want to go to uh, Peter Curtin, or you want to see if somebody wants to wants to ask us questions? Uh, we could do hey, both. we'll do both. If you have a question about any of the killers or anything else that you want to uh, run up mine or Alan's flagpole here, let me know. But as you can hopefully now see on the screen, we've got Peter Curtin. Also, uh, play a sound for baked salmon. Baked salmon in the house. <laughs> <laughs> so so you had hopefully you've been able to see that we're sort of building in uh presentation here because there was very little active information about carl they only found it out after the fact with mm-hmm. fritz you know he basically opened up like a book and did a whole bunch of terrible shit but peter is a very special type of murderer yeah um he was uh born of poverty mm-hmm. he was a, he was came from an, an abusive family in Mulheim on Rhyme on uh, the 26th of May in 1883 he was the oldest of 13 children two of whom had died in an early age yeah Curtin's parents were both alcoholics who lived in a one-bedroom apartment oh. and Kurt Curtin's father frequently beat his wife and children particularly when he was drunk when intoxicated, Curtin's father often forced his wife and children to assemble before him before ordering his wife to strip naked and engage in intercourse with him as his children watched. And, like, hearing all of the stuff that his dad did that were just the precursors to him being a monster, I am surprised that his dad was not a more prolific villain and or murder and or whatever than peter himself because yeah yeah i I mean i I don't know if the father was coherent enough to come uh to uh commit murder right yeah because he's a total boozer wasn't wasn't a hell father he wasn't a he wasn't a good father you know um uh, later the the mom would get his mother would get a uh, restraining order and she would remarry to a guy who was uh, more of uh, a, uh, a a very good standing person. Um, but uh, Curtin, I mean, he just, you know, I mean, and it's like he actually, from from my research, uh, he was very, um, 
and it's it's kind of it kind of makes me feel kind of weird uh you know when they talk about you know um he 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 watched his parents have sex and it would turn him on yeah for some reason. and that that to me that's kind of bleh, you know um and, and and you know our our parents don't you know the thing is we don't want to see our parents as sexual beings no you don't even you know, want to like yeah the the one thing a child never ever wants to come to terms with is how they were made even as an adult you do not want to spend time <laughs> thinking about your production no. or your moving down that assembly line no no i mean you know my my daughter you know i mean i'll, I'll you know i'll i'll kiss my wife she's a beautiful girl um um, you know, I, I don't deserve her. She's just incredibly beautiful. And then my daughter, who's 20, 20 years old ago, ew, <laughs> so how the hell you thought you got here? Yeah. You know? So, but we don't like to, like to, to know that our parents are, uh, sexual beings. Uh, it's weird. For Curtin, for Curtin, it was something that, um, you know, he was, uh, he took uh, sex and murder were went hand in hand and um he basically uh later on he said that he committed his first murder at nine years old and he kind of uh made uh he uh, somebody that was his age and he kind of made him drown he drowned him so what, um, i have a question for you about yeah. that so this this story comes from Peter himself, where he says, you know, he was out on the lake with some friends, pushed one in the water who couldn't swim, and he, according to his story, he killed both of them. And, and there was no actual substantiation of it. Right. So um, I I think like I don't know why hero not heroes but murders also need like weird origin stories. Like you're already Peter Curtin. We don't mm -hmm. need the fact that like, oh, you know what? Let's let's put some icing on this cake. And I started murdering at nine. So I have a question from Gavin. OK. He messaged me on Facebook. It says, great show. My battery croaked while hiking and <laughs> might again. So if y'all find my bones near Pima Canyon Trail uh -oh. at South Mountain, and it wasn't a serial killer. It was the grouchy Havelina family I encountered. Also, could you ask whether the one killer named Papa Danka was spelled like like Dank? D A N K E. I think it's D E N for thank you. D E N K E. Yeah. D E N K E. So and, and is that how you spell how do you spell thank you in German? Isn't that Danke? Danke is D A N K E. <laughs> okay. So one Dankeschön. one little change. Close but <laughs> Maybe Danke But hey, uh okay. let's throw out some love to Gavin, our resident paleontologist. Bam. Thanks for listening. Oh, he's your paleontologist? That's our paleontologist. Yep. Oh, okay. I've got a vast okay. staff I'm building. I've got paleontologists, historians, for one, uh, musicians. I wish I had somebody to interview. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, if you want to do that, maybe we can talk about it a little bit later. You and I can do the do a, um, a show on um, the, the conspiracy theories. Oh, yeah, and we can totally. do that on my channel. Do it. Yeah, I would totally be down to talk about conspiracy theories because I love crazy okay. shit. Not necessarily buying into it, but I love to talk about it. Okay. Well, I just uh, one of the things. Let's get back to Curtin. Yeah. This this is kind of um, uh, when I first heard about Peter Curtin was a book by Donald Rumbelow. <laughs> Jack the Ripper uh, fame. Book, yeah, called uh, Jack the Complete Jack the Ripper Casebook. Um, Curtin was into also bestiality. Oh, and what? He, yeah. Yes. Yeah. He went, he actually had sex with pigs and he would kill them while he was having sex with them. And yeah, I um, remember one of his stories in particular where he was like getting on with a lamb mm -hmm. and yeah. then he decided, I don't, but that's the thing, like whatever happy quote unquote happy accident this was like after banging a sheep, he's like, oh, you know what? I'll try stabbing it. And it just like, that was the fuse to the powder keg. Oh, my God. Yeah. And 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 that's what kind of started him into. Um, yeah, I don't think he he, he actually uh, uh, drowned someone. I think it was more or less uh, 
uh, you know, kind of make himself a little bit more important than he was. Totally. Uh, you know, um, and but yeah, he was he was having uh, sex with animals and he he uh, actually he went was taken under a wing of a, uh, a dog catcher. Yeah. And the dog catcher actually showed him how to enhance his his sexual heightness by having uh, 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 sex with these animals. That and is, that's where, yeah. So that yeah. now that you bring that up, yeah, it, it's all coming back to me. And Peter Curtin is literally, maybe not literally, but virtually a perfect storm. Like, mm-hmm. it, like he could have gone one way or the other watching his father sexually assault his mother. Fine. He could have gone one way or the other. Here, 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 here. But the fact that that happened, he was abusive, dad was an alcoholic, and then he also happened to just run into another dude who loved the sick shit he was in that they shared an apartment building. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah. you could not have yeah. manufactured a more perfect scenario for someone to become an it's absolute... It's a perfect storm. Yeah. It's a perfect storm for a serial killer, you know, birds of a feather. He was okay. forged in the crucible of murder and came out as pure as a goddamn diamond. Mm. Yeah, but, you know, the thing was is that uh, Peter Curtin was very sloppy um, True. when when he when he uh, committed his crimes. And um, he his first murder was in uh, May 25th of 1913 during the course of a burglary at a tavern in Mohammed Rhine. Uh, he encountered a nine-year-old girl named Christine Klein. I, I think I sent you a, a picture of her. Right. She was asleep in her bed. And Curtin strangled the child then slashed her twice across the throat yeah. with a pocket knife. Um, ejac- he ejaculated as he heard the blood tripping from her wounds onto the floor by her bed and on his hand. Now, the girl's uncle um, was put on trial for that murder. So sad. And, and, and ugh, like, because of a handkerchief with some accidental yes. matching mm-hmm. initials. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I think his name was uh, Christoph Klein. And then you have, you know, Curtin, Peter Curtin. or yeah. or it, uh, 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 um, pa- Paolo or something like yeah, that. His Klein, but it was brother uh, just but, happened to have the same initials as the oh, yeah. person who murdered his niece. Ugh. Exactly, and he was uh, ostracized by the family because <sighs> they didn't know uh, that you know uh, Peter Curtin had done this. Right. Um, he also uh, two months later, in the course of a committing a murder with the aid of a skeleton key, uh, Curtin broke into the ho- a home in Dusseldorf. He discovered a 17-year-old girl named Gertrude Franken asleep in her bed. Curtin manually strangled a girl, ejaculating at the sight of blood spouting from her mouth before leaving the crime scene. Curtin managed to escape from the scene of this attempted murder and the earlier murder of Klein undetected. So she she basically lived, Gertrude Franken. Uh, What gets me is that, is it because you murder someone that you get off on that, that you're going to risk getting caught by sitting there ejaculating because you committed a murder. Well, and refresh my memory because I believe Mr. Curtin here was someone who would also visit the body's postmortem. Uh, he basically uh, injected himself into like, like, what serial killers do? He would in, he would inject himself into the to the investigation. He would uh, visit the crime scenes when they were bringing bodies out of a river, or uh, you know he killed uh, five year old girls. Man, yeah. uh, oh. uh, used a hammer, not only a pocket knife and strangling, but a hammer. You know, um, that's uh, you get a claw hammer in a skull, you're done. Total. Okay? Yeah. Uh, like... Some of them, you know, didn't. Uh, also, he went after um, elderly women, too. It wasn't just young women. Um, he was just uh, looking he went for after anybody with any sort of... Like, oh. if he could get a leg up on whoever, that was the victim. Mm-hmm. Well, he also, uh, not only with the hammer, he used scissors. Yeah, the scissors! Uh, with killing precision. Um, he broke one of the scissors... Uh, in the skull of one of one of his uh, one of his victims, 
Um, but you know, a lot of, he, he hurt a lot of people, but he didn't really kill that many people. Uh, I think he killed maybe six. Uh, but yeah. it was the deviance and the decadence that he used that when, caused people to 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 be frightful of it. You know, I mean, it was called the Vampire of Dusseldorf. Yeah, he just know? seemed and to have like also, almost no plan. Like the uh, outside of like getting a nice big pair of sharp scissors or whatever accoutrement he had to hand, it just felt like he was just roaming the streets waiting for whatever inspiration to strike. Well, he also uh, uh, tried his hand at vampirism, yeah. and um, he uh, basically slashed a girl's throat and started sucking up the blood from her throat, and he wound up throwing it up. Yeah, because, like, you um, can't handle that much iron. <laughs> no, you can't handle that much iron. And, you know, I mean, it's just um, if you, if we look at... <laughs> people that um, think they're vampires now. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at people that, uh, you know, I mean, New Orleans is supposed to be a vampire cult down here. I don't yeah. know about that. Uh, true um, blood? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, uh, again, we don't know where it comes from. But anyway. Well, I, um, I'll, let me tie this in, too, because this okay. leads more credence to the fact that I think John Hay was just from soup to nuts, a liar who put people in acid because John Hay had that story where you're talking it, about Hague. Yeah. Sorry. Hay. H A I G H. Yeah. Okay. John Hay. Okay. When he was yeah. killing people, he made up that like whatever the dreams about the blood and the crucifix and yada, yada. And he talked about how mm -hmm. much blood he would drink from each of his victims. And I go bull shit. You cannot drink cup after cup of somebody's blood and not either get the shits, throw up. You're going to get sick. Yeah. Like here, look yeah. at Peter Curtin. He puked like, I, keep in mind also science is not where it was today back then. So maybe Hegg did not realize that drinking blood would make you sick. But the fact that nobody else thought to call him on his bullshit either just shows you where they were. Yeah. Well, the, a lot of people don't understand that the human body is not designed to ingest the human body. Right. <laughs> okay. So, you know, people, that's why you have, Things like Kuru and mad cow disease, because our bodies are not designed to ingest human flesh or human fluids, bodily fluids. Well, they'll, they'll make you sick. Spongiform encephalopathy. Sick. There are people. <laughs> yeah. There are people that this is gonna TMI, I guess. But like after you have a baby, people eat the placenta for well, their nutritional yeah, factors. I've heard about that. Yeah, I've but heard that, about that. That's the you would yeah. a one off eating your placenta or doing any of these things, I can buy because even if it doesn't make you sick, you're not going to pop out babies all the time and eat like placenta after right. placenta on a right. big hoagie no, roll. No, correct. It's just it, no, it's, it has a yeah. nutritional whatever <laughs> benefits of whatever it has in it. But, yeah. but Allegedly. By, Allegedly. by and large, by and large, the rule of nature is if you start eating yourself as in your own species, shit goes haywire. Right. Look at the Wendigo myth. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah. oh, there yeah. there are reasons why uh, species don't typically cannibalize themselves unless they're weird and, and far out, like insects or yeah. stuff Not like us. that. Prey <laughs> mantis. Yeah. Uh, Scorpions yeah. will do it. Spiders will do it. Snakes will eat their own. Yeah. Uh, crocodiles will eat their own. But they're um, not doing it on the regs. Right. Like if you're no, they're doing it, they're doing it because they're hungry. Totally. But if, if yeah. a crocodile's only diet was other crocodiles, it would be fucked left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. eating oh, another yeah. crocodile every once in a while, fine. Like if Peter Curtin or John Hag or whoever wants to have a little bit of human flesh every now and again. What a hand. Carl I mean, Denkin. Why, why, who, are, who are we to deny it? Yeah, okay, like, just yeah. let him have it. It's the know? weekend. You've been good. It's time for a cheat meal. So you That's throw it, a couple man. metatarsals down the hatch. That's it, man. That's it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> a little Chianti. You know, yeah, I mean, when Chianti. you get a cut, the first thing you do is put it to your mouth to try and stop the bleeding. So Yeah, but we're talking but there's a difference between, <laughs> you know, a little spot of blood and somebody sucking up a blood bank. Yeah. Okay? Right. Of somebody and, else's blood. Yeah, also. but you know, I mean if you look at all these if you look at all these cannibals in the South Pacific, 
Mm. Uh, you know, these people eat flesh, they, they, they consume blood, and they wind up with this disease called Kuru. And it, it's, it's a brain disease. It kills you. You know, um, I don't know how they can go. Well, this is the end product. Uh, man, you know, let me just go ahead and talk in here. But, <laughs> um, but um, you know, when you look at people like um, Curtin, again, you know, David, Krista, is it because the blood causes him to reach a specific climax or is it the sexual facet or is it the murdering facet? That's the thing. What the human... It? The human brain, if you want to visualize it, is this intricate circuit board, right? And the fact that we know almost nothing about it now, like current day, and then throw us back a 110, 115 years or whatever. Mm-hmm. Who who knows? Like the fact that like the, the fact that psychiatrists and psychologists were once called alienists really speaks to the where we were. Yeah. So yeah. who knows? Like the fact that Curtin was able to do all the things he did, and that's part of it too, I think, is once the wheels come off the cart, it's experimentation for lack of a better term. Like we'll, we'll never we will never understand no. <laughs> the the mind of someone that excuse me, Lord, fucked up, okay? <laughs> he was just screwed up. And uh, Krista, I'm sorry, I don't talk like that normally, but, she is you know, I mean, there's no, there's no way to describe how screwed up he was. Um, now, d- was it because of what happened with his parents? Um, you know, uh, the rest of his family didn't grow up that screwed up, okay? There had to be some sort of inherent... Uh, psychopathy there for him in order to do that and to seek it's kind of like a, someone on heroin yeah. you know when someone gets when someone gets hooked on heroin they're constantly trying to get to that first high again and they keep taking more and more and that's what causes people to have uh, overdoses yeah the, you know? the, the chemical cocktail that we hold in the eight pounds that we keep steadily above our shoulders if you're lucky can be thrown off by as little as a few molecules. So it's impossible because like, you know, uh, let's say drug drug use, for instance, you can do a million hits of acid and be the same sort of far out like, whoa, man, peace sort of person you've always been. Or you can be one of those kids who like when uh, weed was made legal in Colorado, you fly your ass out there, go off the chain and jump out of a hotel window. Right. Mm. There's no way yeah. you'll be able to be like, well, pff, if he'd only done or not done X, Y, or Z. Mm-hmm. But mm. let's let's get into the juicy bits of Curtin because I teased a little bit. Fritz lost his head. So did Curtin. And yeah. Curtin yeah. had a fun, not fun, an interesting take on how his uh, execution would feel, right? Yeah, well, what I want to do is I want to go back to where he was caught. Okay. Um, he had um, he had a bunch of victims that he tried to kill, but he didn't kill them. They, 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 they survived, except one uh, poor uh, girl by the name of Maria Hahn. And uh, Curtin first encountered Hahn, whom he described as, quote, a girl looking for marriage, uh, end quote, on 8th August and had arranged to take her on a date to the, get this, Neanderthal district of <laughs> Dusseldorf the following huh. Sunday. After several hours in Hans' company, Curtin lured her into a meadow in order that he could kill her. He later admitted Han had repeatedly uh, pleaded with him to spare her life as he alternatively strangled her, stabbed her in the chest and head, and sat astride her body waiting for her to die. Now, she um, died approximately one hour after Curtin attacked her. Now, this is really weird. Curtin confessed to his wife yeah. th- that he was the vampire of Dusseldorf. And he thought that she was not going to turn against him. Um, but she did. And uh, he 
actually went after a, a woman by the name. He, he kept attacking people, but for some reason he lacked uh, any see through itness. He mm-hmm. he wouldn't finish it off. Okay, um, he met uh, a girl by the name of Gertrude Alberman, and uh, he actually stabbed her in the heart, killed her almost immediately. Uh, he killed uh, Alberman's sister uh, as as well. And he was caught when his wife actually turned him in. And he confessed. And the interesting thing about this was that there was a doctor that wanted to interview him and asked him questions about his life as a child and why did he kill people. Uh, You know, the the, the police actually um, arrested him. Uh, They found his apartment. But it wasn't as nasty and disgusting as Hartman's. Mm. Um, if you look at pictures of Curtin, he's a, he's well to do. He's wearing a coat and tie. Yeah, he's, he's got a hat. Probably what they um, would have called fussy back then. Yeah, he was fussy. He was <laughs> About his attire. Uh, yeah, he wouldn't have hit anybody that was bigger than he was. And there was a, a guy by the name of Ernst Dunat who was a chief inspector. He knew how to handle uh, serial killers. But there was a, a guy by the name of Berg, and uh, he was a doctor, and he he interviewed Peter Curtin, and later Berg published a book based upon these interviews called The Sadist, and that was basically what they believed um, Curtin to be was a sadist, because his murders entailed uh, not only denigrating the body or defiling the body, but also had to do with, you know, uh, sexually uh, defiling the body at the same time. See, Um, he asked Dr. Berg, well, Dr. Berg, he had a question for him. And he said, uh, so Dr. Berg, tell me, um, will I be able to hear the blood flowing from the stump in my neck? Oh. That would be just fantastic, and I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, paraphrasing there, but he did that, and um, he was found guilty on three count. I think it was uh, three or four counts of murder, mm. and back then they used the guillotine, and he was found guilty. And at six o'clock on second uh, of July, 1931, Curtin was executed by guillotine in the grounds of the Klingelputz prison in Cologne, Germany. He walked unassisted to the guillotine. He was flanked by the prison psychiatrist and uh, a priest. Now, his exact words were, quote, tell me, after my head is chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? That would be the pleasure to end all pleasures, end quote. And, you know, based on what we know, scientifically about what happens to a human head after it is separated from a body. He probably had mm-hmm. a good 20 seconds of right. hearing that shit. Yeah. He's probably winking at people. Yeah. You know, while he was doing that. Like I just imagine like if you were going to do the darkest comedy in the world, I can't imagine mm-hmm. a better scene than a sexual sadist looking forward to his own beheading. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah. So, but, but that is wildly like, uh, bizarre because i you you especially like let's say you we all are living in the time of the guillotine and you know they're doing them out in public the french love that shit the germans love that shit heads are rolling i guarantee goddamn t if you were in the audience of these guillotines you were seeing faces blinking you were seeing looks of horror and shock on heads without bodies right like mm-hmm. what's her name? Uh, the 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 queen. They cut her head off, and the dude picked Marie it up and Antoinette. yeah, Marie, Marie Antoinette. When he slapped her face, she like got a reaction. Like, there was a reaction to like a oh, yeah. uh, like what? That wouldn't be scarring for a child in the audience at all. But it was it was just like no, par for the course. The Romans watched people get eaten by lions and stab each other. The you know up until like. It was only very recently that we decided to start putting our horrific atrocities we do to one another behind closed doors. Well, here's the question I have, David and Krista. If did uh, publicly showing these 
executions? Did it curb murder uh, murderers? Did it keep people from not committing murders? Probably not. <laughs> I, I don't think there is such a thing as a punishment that detours the uh, infraction. I mean, even now, can't you technically not not everybody can go see an execution like a. a well, you have to be either part of the you family or the legal team, family or, yeah. or law enforcement yeah. or the press. Yeah. So, so, but that's that's the thing. I back when, so let's say when it was a public spectacle and people were gathering in droves to see hangings, beheadings, mm -hmm. shootings, whatever the case may be. It's. Like, that was an event you'd buy tickets for. Like, I forget who it was, but when somebody's head was cut off in France, like this, I'm going to sound like an idiot, but the, the, the details are true. When a head was cut off of this famous person, people were running up and dabbing their handkerchiefs in the blood for souvenirs. That's disgusting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, well, they did the same thing when Dillinger was killed. Yeah. So but do, he wasn't he wasn't uh, decapitated, but they, they did that. Yeah, they, they, they morbid, will, the morbid darkness to the back mm -hmm. of the brain. That's why you have. That's why you and I have these shows. Well, also look what they that. did to uh, Gein's farm. It was carried off piecemeal by ghouls like you or I, who would go there and get a piece of the action. So do I think that any punishment will stop any crime? No. Negative. Well, I kind of take offense at being a ghoul. I'm a mild mannered pervert. So you know, <laughs> All right, I'll just, be the uh, I'll be the ghoul. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mild so, mannered pervert. I mean, if somebody were to come to me and say, "Look, oh, and 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 we forgot to say, uh, Peter Curtin, um, after he was uh, decapitated, his head was lost for a while, until after World War II, and then his head was displayed." Uh, in Wisconsin Falls, Wisconsin, at the Ripley's Believe It or Not, and I think we have a picture. I think yeah, I you you see it on you've seen it on the the roll, gentle viewer. When you see that head cleave down the center like a melon, ready to be bald for a fun church picnic, <laughs> that's his goddamn head. It sit. Yeah. It's I don't know where it is today, but it sat on a hook. And for, it's the same place. It was authenticated. Yeah, um, two bucks a gander, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you've ever been in a, at a um, uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, we used to have one down here. Uh, a lot of things were kind of um, uh, fabricated because mm -hmm. that's what they wanted. They wanted yeah. people to, mm -hmm. to, to, to see it. Well, so. the gap, it's like a Fiji mermaid. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. um, we're at 11.43. Do we need to do anything? Uh, <laughs> if you're let's start the show yeah all right all right so welcome to the show everybody two hours of preamble <laughs> this is the green room <laughs> no but yeah i i if um if you're ready to wrap this up we can start winding it down because after we get to you know the bisected head of peter Curtin hanging out in the museum where a mother with two three-year-olds walking in could pay their fare and see, oh, look, this is a German serial killer, and we get to see his head now. We're here in Wisconsin. That's it's crazy. not so much a German serial killer as it is an oddity, <laughs> and that's what they, they mean by that. Yeah. You know, um, And um, the thing is, the Germans are very proud of their serial killers, from what I understand. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, not proud. But, well, you know, they, <laughs> look they what we got. Them. Yeah, hey. Well, know. yeah, it's probably um, in the same vein that, or rather, in the same genre of the comments you got about Ivan Milot, right? If yeah. if you don't have much to yeah. stand on, anything needs to be accurate, I suppose. Well, that's the same. Like we were the last live show. I feel like we were talking about, like we talked about the serial killers in Arizona, and like what we hey, we've got the baseline killer, or whatever. Yeah, we're the baseline and, killer. Yeah, that's our guy. Yeah and, yeah, and you've got yours, serial and shooter. I'm like, I don't know about Connecticut, but there's probably somebody, but I have no idea. Oh yeah, they're, they're, every <laughs> state we, has. You know, I mean, what gets me is what gets me is is they they put um, Madame LaLaurie in the same. Uh, genre with serial killers when actually she was just a sadistic slaveholder mm. you know um uh, and um i mean there's been so many things that haven't been able to I i'm interested in shit that we can confirm mm. not you know uh urban myths yeah and, I, and things that have been legends so there are you know like everything in true crime you've got these two big veins 
and you've got the stuff that is solved, and then you've got the unsolved, and I hate the unsolved. Boy, oh boy, do I hate yeah. hearing all of the tragic events, all of the gruesome details, and then to be left with like, well, and the case is still open 40 years later to this day. Ta-da! I hate that! Well, did we ever figure out who the Zodiac Killer was? Still no. Mm -mm. I thought. They, I mean, I thought. I thought, I thought, thought it was some relative that some guy said that uh, you know uh, that it was his uncle or something like that. Something, <sighs> something came out. Like I've, a few I've looked past. into it and I found nothing that compelled me to believe anything one way or the other. Like the oh, okay. I forty five killer was just identified, but he's been dead for 10, 20 years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But Bake Salmon yeah. brings up the Night Stalker. Yeah, in so Southern California. SoCal. Yeah. Yeah. Have we heard? Have we heard about? Have you guys ever heard about the uh, Happy Face Killers or something? Oh yeah. Is that uh, is that a real thing? Because um, <sighs> I've been looking at some videos that kind of like were lost video. You know, they had the lost footage type things, and and it was kind of I don't know ridiculous uh, <sighs> that uh, they actually showed the people that were killing the Happy Face, the, the, killing these these young men. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, the thing is, is that it's not my job. It's it's beyond my pay grade to solve things. Right. It's just to present documentation. That's it. The happy face murders, not happy face, but the, yeah, the smiley face murders, were those were like still to this day hotly contested because there's a guy out there and I think his name is Keith Jesperson, maybe. Mm -hmm. His nickname was Baby Huey because he's like this big, tom, dumb looking like, you know, dead-eyed sort okay, of yeah. uh -huh. and he, he, they thought he was that guy for a long time but you know with uh -huh. over or up to rather 200 active serial killers yeah I, so how many I, did he kill uh keith jesperson yeah or allegedly i, I don't remember Mm -hmm. That's the thing. F facts and figures and numbers and all the specifics like i can barely pull a name <laughs> play a sound okay. for polly's cracker joining us uh, welcome to the show, Polly's Cracker. <laughs> Glad Who's to have Polly's you. Cracker? He's uh, one of our viewers. Classic oh, okay. fan. Hello, Polly's Cracker. How are you? Polly wants a cracker. Happy Here he is. Okay. <laughs> okay. But yeah, right. I there are so th there are some odd things that you could throw into a Ripley's Believe It or Not, like. Mm -hmm. But some of these things are ethereal. Like, let's say the number of plumbers who broke open serial killer cases, right? Hmm. Uh, what was his name? Plumbers that the blow broke open serial killer. Oh, well, yeah, there was one uh, uh, that, that broke one open in uh, Great Britain. Yep. Dennis Nielsen yeah. was the serial killer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the plumbers found uh, flesh in the in the uh, in the pipes and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Why is my drain clogged? There was a dude, yeah. I can't remember his name. He's a big fat looking piece of shit. I hate his guts. I can't remember his name, but he did the same shit. Like he lived in a basement apartment of some other unknowing people. Their toilets got clogged. A plumber showed up, started pulling chunks of human out, and the dude got arrested immediately and he's like, "Hey man, can I get like some Wendy's or something? What? A, I wish I knew this dude's name. I hate his guts. Oh my gosh! Mm -hmm. But yeah, remember, don't get emotional about serial killers. Remember I know. that, David. Don't it, get emotional. It's yeah, because you want to. It's all done. It's all in the past. It's not like you're watching it happen in real time. But when mm -hmm. you get these killers who are just flippant about it and are. Almost like either Fritz or Peter who, like, when they're caught, they just open up. Mm -hmm. I don't know which mm -hmm. I like more and which I hate more. If I see a serial or someone accused of a serial killer type scenario and their story changes every three seconds and they string the families along, I don't know if that's worse than the dude who sits down, crosses his legs like Ted Bundy, Picks up a nice, you know, venti Starbucks, and he's like, "Okay, which victim do you want to hear about first? <laughs> what? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the same yeah. with uh, Krista Lehman. She just they arrested her, and she's like, "Yeah, I, I killed all these people. I didn't mean to kill my best friend, but it happened. Whoops, like, that's a mulligan. Yeah. Sorry." And then she would like yeah. be in prison and be like, "Okay, are, are there people around? Like, can I talk to them about how I killed these people? 
Like she was, she had no emotion, no nothing towards. She was sad that she killed her best friend by accident, but she that was it. Yeah, An- another yeah. one of these concepts is like the number of people who, as soon as they get into jail, like get in with their celly and they start like opening up. Yeah, yeah. Like it just yeah. becomes an after school special where you're sitting Do on they? a. A, a metal cot with a fucking mattress that's half an inch thick and you're like oh I feel bad and then a dude like covered in prison tats and like a spider web tattoo on his face is like hey oh, man yeah. why are you so down <laughs> that's yeah, who you want to open up to it's it's like well you know unless you're a complete loner or you are mute um, mm-hmm. you want to tell people what you did allegedly um, it depends on what, what um, you know what what phase you are in being caught, you know? Um, and, and the thing is, is a lot of people, uh, you know, serial killers don't have consciences, No, you know? So they ha- either have to be tricked into it or told, look, okay, game's up. All right. This is, this is done. Yeah. One, one of the, one of the cases I'm going to leave you with this was, uh, Henry Lee Lucas and, um, Otis tool, um, who allegedly killed Adam Walsh. Oh, uh, right. If, Okay, but I have heard that it was not Otis Tool. It was more closer to Walsh's family that killed Adam Walsh. But again, conspiracy theory, and we can mm. talk about that right. again. You know, that's that's the uh, problem with. I shouldn't say problem, but that's one of the intricacies of true crime. Is like if. Like very few cases are solved unequivocally, right? Like not every murder is going to be Ed Kemper. Who's like, yeah, I did it. Here's the thing. Like, Hey, I'm Jeffrey Dahmer. Or I'm Ted Bundy. And here's all our stuff and yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we're, we're all sort of in this quagmire together and people who want to study them, people who want to, but there's, I don't think there's anything we can learn from serial killers aside from their personal history. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't, it doesn't lend uh, that type of psychopathy does not lend into preventing further serial killers. Yeah, Cause how could it? Yeah. I just don't, I don't see it to prevent serial killers. You would have to ensure the impossible task of every human born receiving some form of treatment that most of us find acceptable. Now, with that many caveats, how do you think that's going to go? Right. You know, you can't you can't just go, OK, we're going to study this. And, and, you know, the thing is, is that uh, behavioral science and profiles are an art. They mm-hmm. aren't a science. OK, until they are a science, then they're kind of useless. I mean, because some profiles will say this is the personality type. Yeah. Well, what if you have a personality type? that, uh, you know, likes to write letters to the, to the police. Uh, they exhibit at serial killer behavior, yet they haven't killed anybody. Right. And like, you'd be looking up, looking up the wrong tree. Mm-hmm. For know? instance, like I love John Douglas, the FBI profiler who basically yeah. pioneered. I love his books. I love the work that he does. However, it's nothing more than basically informed cold reading. Mm-hmm. Like, what was the guy's name uh, who shared the name with the senator who had that cold reading show on TV? John. Oh. John Carradine. What's his name? <laughs> what? I don't no know. idea. Hey, whatever. Uh, or Sylvia Brown. Let's just say her because she's a was. She's dead. I think personal opinion, hack and a liar. But I feel the same way about the Long Island medium. Well, yeah. So then, but here you go. So. John Douglas takes, you know, evidence and then sort of works his cold reading on it. But that's the thing. It's it's implication. It's inference, which can help. But it's not a science. So Polly's art. Polly's cracker says Otis got got in so many lies, got caught in so many lies. They didn't know what to believe anymore. Confessed to over 100 kills. But you can't take anything he said as truth. Right. Right. And same thing with Henry Lee Lucas. Uh, Henry Lee Lucas was merely uh, uh, admitting to things because he was getting special treatment. They had detectives from all the major police departments that were going down to Texas to interview him on on uh, on uh, cold cases. Mm-hmm. OK. And, you know, the thing is, is that unless they know the details, they're just making crap up. 
Yeah. But the cops wouldn't let them know that. The cops mm. wouldn't let them know that they, right. they, they did that. But like how so, many how many people have been you know implicated in the Green River? Like let's say the Green River killings. Like that has a big murky area where they think this might be a person, but we've got the guy, but we still don't know because here's the thing about humans. They're liars. <laughs> like as yeah. much as I would love to think that one day we'll be able to sit someone down and whatever, sodium pentothal was the perfect idea that someone had one day, but let's say it, we find something that actually works. Eh, eh. Until then, you're just going uh, based off of evidence and maybe just a tall tale. Well, unless, tor unless torture becomes legal again. Yeah, but know, then you um, get everybody con confessing to everything once you're pulling their toenails off. Right. <laughs> you start off slow. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm 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 letting everything go here. Uh, the little secrets of the trade, but yeah. Well, um, well, we, well anyway, let, well, let's just bring back, you know, the bucket, the rat, and some hot coals, right? I'm more. Of, I'm a fan people. of the uh, Iron Maiden. Uh, I really oh, yeah. do think that's that's pretty good. Pick your poison. Um, the I Chinese that you water can, torture is always the, the hobbling wheel. Yeah, water torture. Mm -hmm. We've got the thumb mm -hmm. screws. Any of these work at getting information. <laughs> yeah, I mean the thing is, is that uh, again, you know, we mentioned that there are you can't be a serial killer. Two people can't be a serial killer doing the same thing because one of them is going to rat the other one out. Yeah, it happened you know, here. And and if somebody does a profile on two people, you're not going to be able to find that person because there's going to have so many uh, dribs and drabs coming mm -hmm. in. They're going to think it's one person doing it. You well, know? yeah. Uh, the the uh, oh, who was it? The Stranglers in uh, in in California, Angelo Bono, uh, I think it was. Oh yeah, and Bono his, and his dipshit uh, cousin. Yes, yeah, his cousin. <laughs> they they found him because they both. You know, they they actually held the same sexual proclivities, so it was easier to find them. Hillside Stranglers. Oh yeah, yeah. The Hillside Stranglers. We we had that here too. I think I mentioned on the last show, but like back in early aughts, like 2008, we had the baseline killer and the spree shooter, and for okay. a long ass time they thought that was one dude. Then they thought it was two dudes, and it turns out it was three dudes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So, but that's the thing. You you're looking at the evidence of something knowing how many people are involved. So yeah, it's it's cold reading, mm -hmm. but that, it, sometimes it works. It's why psychics still come out, psychics, quote unquote, come out of the woodwork to mm -hmm. offer their quote unquote services to the police. Because if by the grace of whatever God or deity they are praying to, they get something right, they're set for life. You're Sylvia Brown. You're John, what's his nuts? Edwards. John Kerry. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Kerry. No, John, John Edwards. Yeah, John, John Edwards. Oh, John Kerry, definitely. Yeah, John Kerry. He's a psychic, right? <laughs> John Edwards. A John Edwards. Psycho. He, he talked to the know. dead. It's, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You, you can't. There's no such thing. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what his, Whatever. That's what his stick was. So, tell you what. We're going off the rails a little bit, so why don't we start wrapping it up? And I'm going to do something I've never done before. We're going to circumvent staff recommendations from all of us because everybody here is going to throw our weight behind. Number one, true crime, dark imagination, man's dark imagination. The links to the killers we discussed are in the description of this show. So if you go like, hey, that was interesting. Now I want to know the facts instead of somebody. <laughs> me. <laughs> Watch watch Alan's videos. Go to his uh, channel. Watch about the Blackout Ripper. Uh, Alan, remind everybody of your books, obviously. Give me those titles. Uh, Dark Bayou, Infamous Louisiana Homicides, and Bloodstained Louisiana, uh, 12 Cases, uh, 1896 to 1934. And I have a book coming out in the fall called Southern Evil. So uh, it's going to be uh, Murderous Tales of Racism and jealousy and all kinds of things uh, put out by Touchpoint Press. So uh, that's going to be in the fall. Uh, yeah, if if you're like me and are persnickety about details and like to pick shit apart, there's one channel out there that has uh, basically a bulletproof shield of being like, I don't know. And it's Alan because he will research these things and bring you Actual photographs, actual testimony, actual evidence. It's not 
It's all out there. It's yeah. out there. People just don't know what to look for. It's not hard. But you need to have the mind of an educator to put it in such a way that you right. have on your channel. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank so you. So that's what separates. Like, it's, it's the difference between, like, your competent, agile of mind or whatever uh, civics teacher versus the person they send in when that person is sick. <laughs> yeah. To just give out yeah, like I don't, I don't think, a pop quiz. I wish they'd let me teach a course in true crime. I really do. But the problem is it's not transferable. Right. Because the then what do you do with it? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be an elective. Uh, but, uh, you know, if we could do that in the colleges where I work, man, that'd be we'd, we'd have full classes every semester. Right. Like, and, and for no other reason than like just for the fuck of it, like the, the college. I don't want to get started on college. But if college offers you things that like, hey, in between math and all the things that we say that you need, but actually don't, you can take some fun stuff, too. We'd all be like, woohoo, but fine. Mm -hmm. But let's yeah. I'm going to double down. Check those links in the description. Go down the rabbit hole of Alan's channel. Check out his books. Check out his stuff. Look at the shirt my wife is wearing. He made it. It's cool. Uh, just do do what you can to support someone who actually uh you know, puts in the legwork, you know what I mean? Like, I am here simply to draw attention to Alan because I have no expertise nor knowledge. However, I think you should be listening and, and or looking at someone who has all the things that I don't. Well, we're going to do a show. We're going we're gonna to do one on conspiracy theories. I, uh, it, whether you, we'll do it on your show, we do it on my channel. You know, it's no big deal, but it's it's midnight here and I'm really tired. Totally. Maybe can I go now? Yeah. I, I'm sorry to keep you up so long past your bedtime. Also, if you're right, watching I'm this sorry. and enjoy our back Old. and forth, look at our other episode where we talk about the Axe Man and oh, all yeah. that stuff. It was very mm -hmm. fun. Yes. Uh, Alan, everybody in the typing square who came to interact, I want to say thank you to all of you because this has been, uh, again, I, I'm going to call this a wild success. Yes. Yeah, it's it's some sort of wild thing. Yeah, it's, it's success. Yeah, okay. Uh, here, here we have Alan invoking Tone Loke, right? <laughs> wild thing. Anyway, guys. Yeah. <laughs> let's, now that I'm losing you with references, let's actually start winding down by hearing the theme song. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, future Thank people. You, man. If, Thank you. Yeah, right. I appreciate it. We'll have you back on to talk about more wild stuff in the future. I guarantee okay. it. So until next time, everybody, thank you for watching, and we will catch you next time on another live episode and or the recorded episode of the podcast, and yada, yada, yada. We'll catch you later. <laughs>